God help us, illumine us. What is the truth of his gospel, the truth of his teaching. So tonight, again, we're looking at, in particular, we're going to pick up from last week. We're going to finish up last week. So we will looking, be looking for the first couple uh, minutes. We'll be looking at 220 to 22. But the focus will mainly be in the second session tonight on the uh, important topic of um, Gnosticism in our day. But let's go right to the text. Let's, let's look at the text and we'll read the Greek uh, again and the English. And we'll look at some discrepancies and some issues with the language and the translation. And from verse 20 now. Ala echo katasu oliga o diafistin genekasu isavel ilegiaftin profitin ke didaski ke plana tu semus dulos por nevsi ke fagin idelotheta. Eduka aftin krono nina metanoisi ke utheli metanoise ektis por nias aftis idu valo aftin istin klinin ke tus. Michevundes metaftis is lipsin megalin, e an min metanoisuin ecton ergon aftis, ket a tecna aftis apoptenon en thanato, ke genoscun de pas i ecclesie, o de ego emi o erevnon, nefrus ke cardies, ke doso emi ne casto cata da erga imon, e min de lego tis lipise tis endin en theatires, Osi uk echosi din derechin taftin, itnes uk egnosen ta vathia tu satana, os legosin. U valo efimas alo varos, plin o ekete kratisete akris u an ixo. Understanding I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. And here we have a discrepancy with some Greek manuscripts. And it seems that the, the patriarchal text cover, carries, uh, follows this as well, and that it's uh, thy wife or thy woman, Jezebel. In the Greek, we have the term su, which means thy or, or your woman, uh, your wife, Ze Jezebel, which uh, Father Athanasius actually says, I think I said last week, he believes that this reading that we actually see in the King James is the proper reading which calleth herself a prophetess, teaching to, to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Theatira, as many as have not talked, and which have not which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. So um, just some small discrepancies with the Orthodox New Testament translation that we like to consult because it's literal. Um, a slight difference here with the King James in its reading in several places. We'll talk about that in a second. So I'm not going to um, uh, talk. There's several discrepancies with the King James, actually, a number of them. Uh, but what we see here is that, um, as we said earlier, the whole question of, Thy wife, Jezebel, which does seem to be a strange reading according to Elder Athanasius. And also, I am the one who, which is closer to the Greek, uh, and the Greek, and the King James says that I am he. So a little bit closer to the Greek there. Otherwise, not any major differences. But you see here in, in, our, in our breakdown, coming from the Orthodox New Testament and explaining every last part of their translation they're giving us and i'm not going to go through most of this not that essential but you uh if you have the orthodox new testament or if you want to just study it on your own here you can see that there are, the king james has a lot of discrepancies with the 
uh, Constantinople text and other texts that are coming from the East. And so, uh, but not all that essential, not all that essential, really kind of minor. Uh, and the same here. The rains here, interesting, nephrus, uh, strictly the kidneys, but in plural, it's used figuratively in the, of the uh, inmost feelings, thoughts, and purposes of the soul. So it's a figurative usage there. And then <clears throat> uh, here in 68, 224b, where we're going to talk about it, the second half of our talk tonight, who did not come to know the deep things, itines uk agnosen ta vathia, vathia, uh, itines is from ostis, meaning which very ones or the very ones, and the exploratory definition is in Revelations 1.7. Did not come to know is the second orist active in Gnosko. So just some. Uh, and then the final one, which is interesting, the deep things of Satan, is the name given here to the teaching of the Nicolaitans as predecessors of the Gnostics, which we're going to talk all about tonight. And the Caprocratians, the Nicenes, and various other Gnostic groups who self-styled their false teaching the deep things of God. So it's there are, there's a clear reference to Gnostics here already from our Lord to St. John, the deep things of Satan, the deep things of God, according to Gnostics. In fact, he's playing on that and, and pointing to these, um, the contemporary Gnostics uh, in that day, which of course applies to all the Gnostics until our day, including the Freemasons who we're going to talk about tonight. So again, we're looking at 220 to 22 in this first section, and we're going to go back which fortunately we didn't get to cover last week. I'm, I'm actually seeing a bit of a pattern develop. We're trying to cover a lot of material in a short amount of time, and inevitably it's very hard to say no to a lot of material, so we're going to we're gonna be a bit behind. So we're probably not going to get to the last 25. It's probably not going to be covered tonight much at all. We'll have to pick up that next week as well. So who is this Jezebel? Who is this Jezebel? Because obviously we, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, we all know about the Jezebel from old, right? The, who was married to Ahab, the Israelite king of the northern kingdom. Uh, and it's an historic person. To, in this particular setting here, the Lord is referring to a historic person, not to a figurative person. There's a, a woman in that church who was a participant in the holy mysteries and who was portraying herself as not only faithful, but a prophetess. So someone here now is in the midst of the faithful, corrupting the faithful. She was a false prophetess. And to understand properly why the Lord characterized her, characterized her as Jezebel, we should probably go back and just remember uh, the historic, the in the Old Testament, that this woman was very dangerous to the, in the Old Testament. Um, and she destroyed in many souls and brought many to destruction, and she sought out the destruction of, of the prophets, sons of the prophets. But the reference here is probably not to a literal um, uh, fornication and idolatry. It's not, in this case, according to Elder Athanasius, it's not literal but metaphorical. In other words, spiritual realities with adultery terms of the faith and we definitely refer in the church and always have to a spiritual adultery a spiritual fornication when we have a mixture of orthodoxy and heterodoxy orthodoxy and heresy uh truth and falsehood uh, light and darkness you have on a spiritual plane fornication unfaithfulness uh and walking away from the union with god for union with the devil and so here, uh, that's what is happening. It's, it's apparent as we'll go forward, we'll see that it's apparent this is what he's talking about. Not literal, it could be literal, but very unlikely. In the Old Testament, the words adultery and fornication are very common. And here the Lord speaks about adultery and he says, and the children born of her, I will kill, says the Lord. And that makes a huge impression. We were reading that earlier. I think it probably jumped off the page to a lot of you. I mean, he, he's very... It's very blunt and very just kind of, you know, uh, amazingly harsh. I will kill her children with death. But is that referring to a literal slaying of the body? No, it's referring referring to the children of fornication, the, the, the 
the, the those who spiritually have departed and those who refuse to repent. So they're talking about rebellion against God, rebellion against the true God. And so we're referring to spiritual adultery. Uh, however, this is not always apparent to everyone, in, including those in the church and including those in church leadership. It's not always apparent that we have a adultery spiritually and that we have a perversion, a distortion. And apparently the bishop here in the here was also not doing his due diligence. That this was a spirit of delusion that had crept in and and an adultery from faithfulness to God. What we have, in other words, is a woman who is playing the prophetess and involving people in the Gnostic heresy of the day. Now, if you go back to the original Jezebel, we have, what do we have there? We have a demonic woman controlling, manipulator, introduced idolatry, persecuted the faithful, and the prophet Elias, persecuted the prophet Elias. And, of course, killed the prophets of God, some of the sons, the so-called sons of the prophets, uh, introduced the worship of Baal, sexual immorality. That's the Old Testament, original Jezebel. In Revelation, the Lord says to the bishop, this woman comes to destroy the people of God. Obviously, he is displeased with the bishop of Thyatira and was, that he was not distancing her from the church. In other words, he was allowing for a secularization of the church. He was allowing for foreign uh, doctrine, foreign ethos, not of God, not of Christ, to be pushed within and among the faithful. And this was a dereliction of duty and very, very serious. Uh, we did see that, however, in, in all graciousness, the Lord did not say he was going to punish him, but he was going to fight against his enemies. So he, he gave him uh, and her actually time to repent. Uh, so there's a failure on the part of the bishop to cut her off from the flock. And this is the role of the bishop. It's the role of the bishop to be on guard and to keep the wolves out and the sheep in. According to Bishop Anthemus, who Elder Athanasius quotes, he, the bishop, was not negating her Christian identity, but was addressing her as a Christian. And by this name, she was able to lead the servants of God astray and make them sub subject to her delusion, committing sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. Uh, and again, this has a metaphorical meaning, uh, according to Elder Athanasius. And it's very interesting that if you take what we're saying here, what's apparent from the text, and you put it in the context today, let's say, of the, the, the dominating ecclesiology of ecumenism and of Protestantism and even of Vatican II, of Catholicism, it's very problematic to have any kind of uh, um, connection, right? We have no real, this kind of strictness in terms of not accepting the self-identification of someone. Oh, I'm a Christian. I believe I'm therefore in the church, which is essentially what we have today in ecumenism and in Protestantism. If you say I'm a Christian and somebody says, no, you're not, they they look at you strange, not at the person who's saying that I'm a Christian. Criteria today are so have been so dissolved that anyone can pretty, pretty much believe in anything can claim to be a Christian. There is no objectivity, there's no external, clear criteria coming down what are the boundaries what is the faith one delivered and so this is a this is a you know a dream come true for the enemies of god and the pushers of gnosticism and they can can operate very easily within the confines of the faithful and not fear excommunication not fear defrocking not fear being cut off uh, by the bishops and others because they've adopted the very least, but there are many, many times, unfortunately, in our day, we have bishops and clergy who are themselves in apostasy, who are themselves akin to this Jezebel, pushing um, false doctrines, fornicating in co common prayer with her heretics, adopting heretical teachings like perennialism, 
uh, and, and the various modern forms of Gnosticism. It's very much going on right now in the church from hierarchies, uh, some, some hierarchs in the Orthodox Church. How much more outside of the Orthodox Church among others uh, in, in the, among the heterodox? So that is, that is uh, very grave implications for our bishops today. What are you doing? to protect the flock from the various heresies, not only in your own diocese, not only in your own diocese. If you remember St. Basil the Great, he didn't say, oh, my own diocese, I'll just keep, you know, I'll just keep my head down and I'll ignore what's going on around the Orthodox world. What did he do? He wrote the bishops in the West. He wrote the, he wrote and worked hard to get his own Orthodox people like St. Gregory the Theologian and uh, St. Gregory of Nice and others to become bishops and to fight against the various heresies, the Arianisms of his day. He didn't, he was a bishop of the whole church. And indeed, every bishop is not only a bishop of his diocese, of course, he's first and foremost a bishop of the diocese, but as a disciple and a, uh, a, a an apostle, successor to the apostles, he's co-responsible for the entire church. So this is a type of the entire church here. This is not. We should not say, well, this, this particular bishop only really had to do with his own diocese. Of course he did. Of course he couldn't leave that. But it doesn't mean he's indifferent to the other diocese, not indifferent to the church status of the church generally. And we, we praise those bishops, St. Sophronios in the time of St. Maximus, St. Photius the Great, St. Mark of Ephesus, uh, St. Gregory of Palamas. We praise all of those bishops who were Catholic, ecumenical. In other words, they were... They were Bangosmi, we say in Greek, right? They were they they belonged to the entire church and they had the care of the entire church because of their confession of faith and their and their struggle. And so it it's not enough to say my little eparchia here, my little dies in the middle of you know the United States in Canada, wherever it is. I just look after myself. I'm not going to get involved. Um, I do not think the spirit here that we see uh, and the and the teaching here is going to cover that kind of parochialism. It's not going to work. We've got to be all co-responsible. It includes everyone in the church. We all bear one another's burden. And so, of course, that bishop would be thrilled if there were people under him, obedient to him in the church there, who worked against the erosion of the faith and the boundaries, uh, supporting the boundaries and and removing the cancers of Gnosticism. What bishop wouldn't want co-workers who were, who were struggling, uh, according to the uh, ethos of the church, to drive out heresy? Uh, so it's very tragic that we have, in fact, from this Jezebel, very likely, according to the uh, other what we have is the rise of Montanism, one of the worst heresies in the early 300, 300 years of the church from this diocese. And after, not long after this, Jezebel uh, probably reposed or died. Forerunner of Mon Montanism is what he calls her. Montanus, of course, was a terrible heretic who believed and taught that he was the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. And he had two women with him like this Jezebel, who claimed they were prophetesses and had visions. And it spread throughout the whole of Asia Minor and all over the church in the, in the East. Montanism was a terrible cancer and a grave Gnostic heresy. And so if, if, if this had been stamped out and she had been cut off, we might not have had Montanism at all. I don't know. It's a speculation, but it's very interesting speculation. So the same Jezebel elder tells us is a forerunner of all those who claim they can invoke the Holy Spirit, perform miracles on television, speak in tongues at will, and perform many signs and wonders. This same Jezebel is a forerunner. So what is, where does your mind go? But there's a, a, a plethora, a, a, a innumerable kinds of Jezebels then in this day and age with the uh, televangelists, of especially my mind goes back to the 80s and 90s, but how many more today with the Benny Hinn and all the rest of the world 
who who are uh, supposedly casting out demons and 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 raising people from the dead and and uh, performing uh, miraculous uh, healings and all the rest. Um, in our day, the, the heretics are innumerable. And here we are right in the book of Revelation showing us uh, exactly why and how um, the church should, should should deal with that. Of course, the, those were out of, out of the church, was inside the church. This, this um, cancer uh, pertains to those inside the church in the, in the book of Revelation, of course. So the bishop is responsible. He is responsible. And this is the entire meaning of the verse, according to Elder Athanasius, that it's the bishop's responsibility to discern any foreign elements, any strange teachings, impure teachings within the church, to expel them immediately. And that's the role of the bishop. The bishop's role is not to mainly do philanthropic work. It's not to be a politician, a diplomat. It's not to go to big fundraisers. It's not the role of the bishop. The role of the bishop is not to do a lot of pastoral one-to-one -one, uh, counseling. It's not the role of the bishop. When the bishop is consecrated, what does he do? He gives a confession of faith. He doesn't do what he did when he was a priest. He'd take the amnos, the holy consecrated body of our Lord and stand behind the altar, which symbolizes that the priest's main role is to protect the holy mysteries and to make sure that they are always uh, dealt with with the greatest reverence and, and that all people coming are worthy and all the rest that goes into being the priest pastorally with the mysteries. That's not what the bishop does. He goes and confesses the faith. He and, he and he clearly is given the role of keeping the flock from the wolves and guarding the boundaries and being the guard at the door. Uh, and so he will give an account for that. It's very obvious here. So there is here apparent a gross Gnostic heresy. And what is Gnosticism? It's a dualism. So it has two extremes in Gnosticism. On the one hand, a belief in the need to destroy the body through indulgence in all pleasures. And that's what you had there in Theatira with the Nicolaitans. You had uh, that kind of Gnosticism most likely. And then you have another extreme, which is also a Gnostic. It has the same, same dualistic approach to God and man and creation. But from the other extreme comes and says, we have to be excessively abstinent. We have to condemn marriage. Uh, and then you, you have such heresies as Manichaeism, uh, Montanism, and the Massalians. And these two extremes coincide in one central point. The dualist doctrine of the Gnostics, where you have an evil God and a good God, with the flesh as the cause or so source of evil, while the soul is the creation of the good God. All right? So the, the, the flesh, the cr creation, the body, all of that is created by a bad God. Right? So it's a bad thing. We need to either destroy it through pleasure or destroy it through abstinence. But it's not good. It's not the real world. It's not the real life. We have to destroy that. So in order to emancipate the soul from the bondage uh, of the flesh that was created by the evil God, we must destroy the flesh, either through depravity or through extreme abstinence. So it's very interesting that those variety of the ancient church we have today as well, and and we have heretical ideas that flow around among Orthodox people, and they're you know misinterpreting and distorting uh, the Orthodox understanding of marriage, for instance. So if someone wants to abstain from marriage, uh, he's not going to disdain marriage. He's not going to. Um, tell people that, that married people are going to hell, which I've heard from monastics, which is very mistaken. Uh, if he's going to want to abstain from marriage, he'll do so in honor of the Lord's flesh, as St. Ignatius says. And not that marriage is something unclean in itself. Marriage bed is undefiled, We, the Lord said, and the, and the, the service says, the marriage bed is undefiled so unfortunately we have 
the idea that you're not going to be saved from marriage. Uh, and of course, there are many things that happen within the married life today, which are not blessed. We've talked about that in some of our shorts in our question and answer sessions. We've talked about the very great distortions of the sexual boundaries, the boundaries of sexual life and marriage. People think that you're married. Oh, you can do anything you like. You can do anything you like as long as you uh, are with your wife or with your husband. You can go ahead and engage in anal sex and oral sex and all kinds of distortions and perversions because, well, that's what's going on all around you in the world. And people think there's nothing wrong with that. And yet it's very, very grave. It is it is the same spirit and sin that was in Sodom and Gomorrah and the Lord destroyed. So this is not, uh, there's no distinction here or no, uh, uh, you know, leniency to the heterosexual perversion distortions uh, because they're in marriage. You have to avoid that which is not according to nature, not according to God's blessing, does not have purpose not within the context of the purpose and and beauty of marriage. And um, we could go on for a long time and talk about that, but it needs to be said. I mean, it, it's awkward to say, but it needs to be said today because very few, unfortunately, know it, including Orthodox Christians, and very few talk about it. And so you're forced to say things in an impersonal setting because people are ignorant, people don't know, and they're not getting taught. So the boundaries are there. And yes, things happen within marriage that are destructive. And yes, people are not saving themselves in marriage. It's possible. But if perversions take place within marriage, one can justifiably say that there is, there is uh, of course, great, great concern for these souls that are perverting the life of the married, the beauty of the married bed, and that which is blessed within marriage. Um, and yet... St. Paul says, no, these are deviations outside the norm, but marriage itself is honorable. Marriage is honorable in everything, and marriage bed undefiled, for God will judge the fornicators and adulterers. St. Paul says in Hebrews. So, no, you can't be a deviant. You cannot be an adulterer or an adulteress. You cannot indulge in unnatural and filthy perversions inside or outside. Inside or outside of marriage. No, these things are detestable to God. The marriage must be honorable. Honorable. And yet it's still a path to salvation and blessed by God. Elder Athanasius recounts from his days uh, in uh, Greek village, he says the following story, which is very interesting. I'm sure there are many of us who have heard such things from our Christians today. He says, the elderly wife of the shop owner said with great sigh when I came in, oh, only you monks will be saved. I don't know about us if we're going to be saved, but only you monks are going to be saved. And he asked, well, why do you say that? Why do you say that? Is marriage an obstacle to your salvation? Who told you this? The elder asked. In fact, these are Gnostic perceptions that only the monks will be saved. Whether people realize it or not, they're expressing Gnostic perceptions. And so this is condemned by the St. Paul, it's condemned by the Lord, it's condemned by the church. Even if today many people feel like they're being lost within marriage. It has nothing to do with the marriage itself. It has to do with what we understand marriage, how we're living it out, and how much we're, we're living according to the gospel within marriage. But these tendencies have always existed, and the truth of the gospel has always been under attack uh, from the beginning. So the Lord is asking the Bishop of Theotia to expel this woman, symbolically named Jezebel, Introduced Gnostic ideas into the church because she's considered a predecessor of Montanism. She needs to be excommunicated if she fails to repent. There is a time for repentance, but when that is up, there has to be excommunication for the sake of her salvation and those of the others. Again, a grave uh, responsibility. Unfortunately, in our day, 
we don't have this kind of decisiveness from many, many bishops. It's very tragic. We don't have this kind of clarity. We don't have this kind of um, uh, these boundaries being established, preached, taught, and given. So everyone has an understanding that they they know the boundaries. I mean, if you don't know the boundaries and you trample on them, well, then you only have half of the fault, really, if the teach if you're not been taught by the bishops and priests as to those boundaries. Um, so it's interesting that the elder says the following. He says that she was a member of the church and she was given time to repent. And he says only someone in the church can repent. What does he mean by that? Obviously, people are changing their life and coming toward and embracing the person of Christ, not only in the Orthodox Church. But so he doesn't mean that when he says repentance. Repentance, what does it mean in Greek? It means reorientation and return to communion with Jesus Christ. And the Orthodox Church ecclesiology and the teaching of the Holy Fathers is that the one church, there's only one church, the Orthodox Church is the one church that's come down for 2,000 years, been faithful, and has continually kept the, the uh, doctrine and, and the ethos of the, of the saints, of the Lord and the apostles, and that in that context, communion, the presuppositions are fulfilled, and communion can be had. That's why it's so important to be a part of the church, obviously. Now, you can follow Christ. You can embrace him from a distance in terms of his teaching, and you can desire him, and you can pray to him, of course, but can you have communion with him? If you don't believe in the holy mysteries, if you're, if you're a Protestant and don't accept the Holy Eucharist as the true body and blood of Christ, of course, the spiritual reality, which is even more real than if it was uh, simply a carnal, quote-unquote, reality, obviously. So people confuse that in the Protestant world. They, they, they've they lost understanding the, the, the meaning of symbolism. They think it's an empty thing, and they, they the spiritual reality is um, this strange dichotomy there that they, they don't feel is real, like there's not a reality there, but it's even more real if we call it spiritual reality. It's the body and blood of Christ. But in any case, not to get off on a tangent, when you don't accept that, you don't embrace that, you don't live the holy mysteries, how can you return? So re the repentance in this meet with this meeting presupposes you're in communion. You fell, she's fallen away from that, but she has ready access to return to that if she repents and comes to Christ in, in confession and, and, uh, and repentance. Someone who's outside the communion, never had communion, is not returning, but is going to, is searching for and finding uh, Christ in the church, which is, of course, there's no separation between Christ and the church. Um, the mystery of repentance, he says, and confession is a privilege and a gift of the church. And that's a hard saying for many today. When we see people who are very sincere, struggling out, outside of the boundaries of the Orthodox Church, we see the Orthodox Church in, in the Western world under assault from secularism and the various isms of our day, ecumenism. And it's hard for us to understand. But this is, the, this is not something that is based on our experience, but that which is coming down to us. It's a teaching that's been there perennially from the beginning from our Lord. So she has time to repent, but she does not want to repent from her fornication. In other words, she does not want to repent from her unclean and polluted teachings. And this is really important to, to drive home. The Orthodox Church and the Orthodox Church in the Christian life, it's not enough to abstain physically and to be a moral person. When we talk about morality as, as, as just a, keeping some externals, keeping the law, keeping being a good citizen and da, 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 da. we have this very dumbed down um, and, 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 and empty uh, many times meaning of what it means to, to uh, live morally. So including in that is promoting and, and, and teaching immoral heretical doctrines. That is an aspect of the ethos. The ethos and the dogma ultimately are not separated. So if I, if I am not, physically fornicating, but I am spiritually fornicating. That is a loss of the orthodox ethos, not only the orthodox dogma, because they're ultimately inseparable. We separate them no, no, notionally. In our mind, we separate them, but in reality, they're inseparable. Dogma and ethos are inseparable. 
They, you cannot have an ethos without a dogma. And the dogma is, is, is gained through an experience of the way and the life. Otherwise, dogma doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. We don't, have, we don't have an experience of the dogma through the way. It, it, it remains ideological. It remains, it remains something theoretical for us. So she's teaching contrary to the gospel and the Lord. And she refuses to repent. So this is an internal affair of the church. We have such cases right now. We have people who are refusing to repent, who are pushing perennialism, who are pushing homosexual uh, lifestyles as, as uh, living those out as acceptable in the sight of God and as, as, as a part of the life of the church. You can live those lifestyles. You can engage in sodomy. You can engage in fornication. You can still be an Orthodox Christian. We have teachers in the Orthodox Church who are saying such things. Of course, they are Jezebel. They have fallen away from Jesus Christ. And they're pushing another gospel, at the very least. They teach perennialism. They teach uh, that you know abortion is somehow uh, understandable, acceptable. They, they 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 talk about these kind of things. So such such teachers are Jezebels. They're they're people. They're forerunners of Montanists. They're Gnostics, and they they are in our life today, unfortunately. So the time is given to repent, but the time has to come at some point uh, up. And has to be implemented by the church uh, through her history. That repentance has to come about. Um, so, of course, they have to be presented with the correct teachings of the Orthodox Church. So what does that mean? What if someone is... It, 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 the rest of the church are responsible for the flock, the priests and the bishops especially, but all of the church is co-responsible to bring those teachings and present them and say, this is the gospel. This is the teaching of the church, you are violating these teachings, you are trampling, you repent of what you're doing for your salvation and for the salvation of those who you're leading astray. So that has to be pre pre presented to those who are astray, going astray. Can't We can't just immediately condemn them. That's not at all the spirit of the gospel here. But if there's no repentance, there's no return, then they must be removed from the, from the body. Otherwise, they're going to corrupt uh, the whole body. So... Um, this is what happened with Arius. Arius was reprimanded and, and, and rebuked numerous times. And of course, he was returned to the church even after the condemnation of Nicaea by the political powers of the day. They were misled into his sincerity. We, we know the history. But eventually he was cut off from the church. He was cut off from the church uh, after um, quite a number of rebukings from in, 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 in Egypt. So that's an example of how the church deals with that. They didn't immediately cut him off. They, they, they wrote to, to him. They had councils against him. And then there was an ecumenical council to deal with him. Many times, however, it is too long. And there's not a proper response in time. So there are five basic characteristics of false movements in the church, according to Elder Athanasius. He gives us very helpful. First and foremost, the first characteristic of the false movements in the church and Elder Athanasius in the book, which I'm not going to get into tonight, talks about a variety of movements that were going on in Greece in his day, the so-called Illumined. Uh, he also references a famous case of a so-called charismatic Pentecostal Orthodox priest in his day in the 70s, actually. Uh, and, and I think it was early 80s. Father Seraphim Rose talks about him as well. His name was Father Sevio Stefano, I think his last name was. And he talks a lot about his teachings and his confusion and his endorsement and embracing of Pentecostalism and all the rest. So there were several things that he gave us concrete examples, which I'm not going to get into tonight. So uh, these false movements, of course, are coming and going all the time. The first is demonic teaching connected to an inter-ecclesiastical phenomenon. So there's a clear satanic, demonically inspired teaching, which is distorting the gospel and preventing people from returning uh, and, and communion with God. Strange foreign teaching irreconcilable with the doctrine of the church. So we have a concrete thing that's promoted, that's irreconcilable. The false teaching and, and, and the teaching of the church coexist. We have a situation where they coexist without condemnation, even though existing for a relatively long period of time. These are movements in the church by those who are, who are pushing this and not being reprimanded, not being uh, ex excommunicated, whatever needs to be to take care of this and bring this to an end. The teaching is directed, uh, directly related to Satan, 
has demonic depth and leads to the worship of Satan is camouflaged, however, behind elements of faith and worship. And you might think, well, that's really extreme. Those Does that happen? It happens all the time. Because do not think that, again, it's not, it's not a two-headed monster. That, that it, it's very subtle. The teachings are subtle, and people don't pick up on them because they're not well-trained, well-catechized. Uh, uh, but they lead people outside. This this whole phenomenon of a free for all in 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 the bedroom of, of the of the couple doesn't matter. They can do anything. Is a kind of Gnostic, uh, you know, the first version of Gnosticism that we talked about. Like, there's no uh, the 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 the, uh, the the royal path. The balance is not kept. You know, again two extremes. In Gnosticism, you have just indulge the flesh, indulge the flesh, doesn't matter, right? And just doesn't matter what you do and just indulge the flesh, it's all blessed, right? And so, of course, they have a whole philosophical idea that you're going to destroy the flesh, but it's a kind of a kind of behavior which reminds us of these Gnostics. And then, of course, you have others that are very extreme against the flesh and you try to beat the flesh down through, a, through a excessive abstinence, those two extremes. So when you have a general outlook on life in Christ, which is distorted and leads people to hell because there's no repentance, there's no sense of, of, uh, of the uh, purification from the passions, but in, in engaging and indulging the passions, well, that's not going to lead people to purification, to illumination. It's not going to lead people to apathy, uh, apathia, I should say. Uh, it's not going to lead people to, to a uh, solidified union with God and 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 the grace and the energies of the divine spirit is not gonna not gonna be fruitful. We're gonna be going to church, communing, confessing, communing, then we're gonna go home and we're gonna lose the grace of God because we're engaged in things that are just total indulging of the flesh. And so it's not it's not like there's a two-headed monster again that's going to be connecting us and it's going to be obvious. This woman was in the church and it was not obvious, apparently, to the number of people. And the Lord points it out and says, this is a false prophetess. Now, she probably, of course, would have been presenting herself as spiritual, as very uh, involved, as very uh, impressive. And then finally, it creates false prophets and false prophetesses. So that's five characteristics of false movements in the church, according to Elder Athanasius. Now, we're going to move on to verse 24. And this is where we're going to get into the vathya to satana, the things, the deep things of Satan, and the uh, whole notion of masonry in our day, the contemporary Gnosticism of our of our. Of course, it's there's many forms of Gnosticism today. If you uh, if you like, but we're going to talk about this particular one. So these heretics speak uh, about the depths of an exclusive wisdom, as secret knowledge. And there's an unapproachable and untouchable wisdom uh, that's off limits to the, the non-initiated, to the infidels, right? Uh, according to them, and that is to the unsacred, the the, the uh, uninitiated. According to Saint Paul, the secret work of lawlessness is always so. There's a mystery of iniquity, a mystery of iniquity that's being worked out continually. It's not just in the ancient church. It's not just in you know, I don't know, Tur Turkish period, not just in the, in the communist uh, atheist period. It's always. So we have that even more, of course, in the end times we're living. So there is a secret work of lawlessness that's going on behind the scenes, among the occult, among the new age. All of this in our day and age is very much alive and well. In our days, one of the offshoot Gnosis is Freemasonry. Masonry is a Gnostic heresy. The books of the Masons call the non-Masons defiled and unsacred or unholy. They claim to have the light, illumination, pathway to the depth of knowledge, the path of wisdom, the depth of wisdom, the depth of philosophy of which they claim we are ignorant. And they definitely have an elite that, that looks down upon the rest of the world who does not have their special knowledge. This is very much all the characteristics of Gnosticism. Masonry has the characteristics of Gnosticism and as such is condemned by the church. So we don't need a, there's no question here. Uh, well, could you be a Mason? Could you be a Mason and, and, and still be a Christian? There's some local churches, there's some people in higher places around the Orthodox Church who think you can. 
it's okay to be a Mason, they say. No, the church has condemned Masonry long ago, long before Masonry was a thing. It was condemned from its outset because it was a form of Gnosticism. So some people will say, well, Father Peter, I know a really nice guy who's a Mason, and he doesn't seem to be a two-headed monster Gnostic, and he doesn't seem to know anything about this stuff. Well, that's because, just like in the church, there are many Orthodox Christians who have no clue about hesychasm or asceticism or much of anything. They go to church, they go home, and they remain fairly ignorant of the spiritual life. There are many Masons who remain very low-level Masons, and they don't have any idea about the higher things and the occult side of masonry and all the rest. So that shouldn't surprise us. Uh, and in every uh, area of life, there are people who are deep in and there are people who are very superficial, whether it be sports or whether it be academics or anything like that. Freemasons, uh, uh, I should say Gnosticism, of which Freemasonry was a Gnostic heresy, uh, the danger behind it is that it denies and wars against Christianity, uh, but it does not deny it officially. So it, 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 on one hand, it presents itself as very respectful of Christianity, but in a deeper way, as you'll see from the text that we present, it very much is, is set against it and, it, and it sees it as it's one of its main enemies. Uh, which may come as a surprise to many people, but that is in the text presented by the Masons themselves. So they receive communion, they sit on parish councils, ten services, um, they uh, use their identity to their advantage. And so there's not, on that level, there's not, you can't always tell the difference between an optic, just like with this Jezebel, and it wasn't apparent immediately to apparently even to the bishop that she was a false prophetess. So it's not, this is not to their advantage, however. They think that they can live a double life. They think they can have two masters. They think they can be Christians and be Masons. But it's obviously to their grave detriment that they go on in this double life. And if you or anyone you know are a Mason or you know people in your church, your parish church that are Masons, you need to be very clear and strict and say what you're doing, the organization you're a part of has this aspect, even if you don't understand it or not a part of it, and you must depart from among them. Because you might be all fairly benign social work, but you're a part of a society and of an organization which has been condemned because of, of other aspects that you may be ignorant of, and you need to depart because you cannot be both. And so being both is to your condemnation. Because the Lord will not, just like with the Jezebel that did not repent, will not have mercy for those who play with the truth of the gospel and, and have two masters. It's not going to be union with God, with those people who have a double life and two masters. It's not going to be, you have to be decisive and be First and foremost, and only a disciple of Jesus Christ. And anything that opposes that, you have to depart from it. So it's not to their advantage, but to their detriment. This is like Jezebel, who moved freely within the Church of Theatir. She is the typology of the contemporary Gnostics and Masons. She is the typology. Very interesting. Now, let's talk a little about some things that are clear. And there's much we could do, of course, a whole evening or two or three on Masonry and Gnosticism, we're not going to do that tonight. We're going to get to the uh, basics and uh, based on uh, Elton Oscar's teaching, of course. So if you, if you come at me and say, Father Peter, how can you say these things? I'm presenting to you what Elder Athanasios teaches. And of course, he is in agreement with all the saints. And he is a one of the greatest followers and implementers of the teachings of the saints in our day. That's why we're sitting at his feet and we're listening to him. So let's look about the Freemasonry symbolism. And first and foremost, as you probably already know, they have this famous symbol here on the right, which is a compass on the top and a square uh, on the bottom. And of course, Freemasonry does not have anything to do with the actual masonry that people uh, learn and go and build houses about. That's not what this is. This is a, a religion and it's a, uh, they worship uh, uh, the, uh, 
enemy of our salvation, and you'll see that in, in a moment. So these are symbols of something else, obviously. This is occult symbolism. Everyone can go to Wikipedia or a number of sources from the Masons themselves, and they can learn all this. is very accessible on the Internet today. This is nothing special that I'm presenting to you in terms of the symbolism. So the, the compass is this is symbolizes the spirit and the square the matter spirit and matter and spirit rules over matter and remember they're gnostics and so they think that matter is evil and spirit is good and they don't think that the god of matter is a good god right and that god of matter you guessed it is the god of the old and new testament he's the god who created all the world he's the creator of heaven and earth and so the creator of heaven and earth for them is an evil god a bad god who needs to be defeated. So here you have, you probably know that, I don't think I knew that before I started looking at this some time ago, that you have a clear symbol of the victory of Lucifer over the over the God of heaven and earth. That's ultimately what this is pointing to. Um, not, it's a little bit of a jump, but that you'll see going forward that that's what is implied in the Gnostic dualism of, of Freemasonry. So there's a chronic war going on supposedly between Good and uh, good and bad, meaning the, the spirit and matter. And now the, the the Gnostics and therefore the Freemasons don't have a very developed and good explanation of the existence of evil. They just don't go there. They don't explain it well and leave it very flu, very you know, very uh, loose. Um, so you know, this is not obviously anything like the Orthodox Christian understanding of the existence of evil. We taught, teach something very different. Obviously, matter is not evil, etc. Uh, now, the symbolism here is interesting. The square has a 90-degree angle. And so this gives a fullness of expression, according to the interpretation given in some Masonic uh, texts. And the compass is a 45-degree angle, which is a narrower angle. And that gives, it's a struggle to control matter. So there's, a, there's an idea here that spirit struggles to control matter and to subject it. Also, you have the G. Now, on the right, I've given you a Greek version of this, which has the gamma in Greek. But you can see on the left, which is also from Greece, which is the stoa, the lodge, the Grand Lodge Freemasonry of Greece. And I think it's the 6007 is the date, according to from creation, apparently. Um, they chose back in the day, 100, 100 some years ago, 120 years ago, I guess, maybe even longer, uh, when it was established, I'd have to look at the chronology according to creation, but uh, you have the uh, symbol of the uh, Lodge of, of Greece, the Freemasons of Greece, at least one of them, I think there's two now, but I'm not that well versed in the Greek uh, Lodge. But in the middle, you have the G, which of course stands, uh, is well known for gnosis, right? Knowledge in Greek, that's the main, reference to the G. G symbolizes knowledge. And you'll see why it's so important for the Masons. But also, they say it symbolizes God, knowledge, God. So uh, uh, God has to do with obtaining knowledge. And we'll talk about, you can, if you think a little bit about these, the way uh, of the interaction of the serpent with Adam and Eve, you can immediately know why that's not Christian. And um, you also have geometry. And, and genesis uh, or gen generation and these are also important and all this g has multiple meanings multiple levels uh you also see on the left very interesting the snake eating its own tail which is an occult symbol going back many many <clears throat> centuries and and uh, into uh pre-christian times and i put on left and right down near the bottom the symbol of the theosophy society which has the star of david in the middle and has the swastika and has the snake eating it. All these 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 sim, these symbols, which are are used also in masonry, are also used in the occult. And you see also in on the right down there on the left side, you see a snake eating its tail again. And and pan is in Greek and topan, uh, all is one, which is another occult idea. Anyway, there's much we could do for hours. We could talk about that, but the symbolism is very interesting here. They don't shy away from identifying masonry with the contemporary occult theosophy and all the rest and of course it's it's not a secret that many masons go on to become prominent uh 
personages in uh, in the various uh, uh, occult uh, movements in the 20th century, and including in perennialism. Uh, it's not an accident that René Guénon passed through the lodge in France. He was a papist, then he became a mason, and then he went, um, <clears throat> of course, he was studying all of this and much more, and then he went on to become a Sufi Muslim down in Egypt. Uh, so masonry has got its tentacles all over the place, and it doesn't shy away from identifying. So if you, again, if you or somebody you know in America is in some lodge doing some, you know, social claim, well, how have they paid attention to the symbolism of masonry? They should probably pay attention to that and not think um, that this is just some uh, service to the community or something. So Freemasonry, there's a 12, we're going to look at the 12 degree initiation. So the first through 11, we're going to look at the 12th degree. So you're going to have to, again, rise up a little bit, spend a little time, be serious about it before you get to these kinds of initiation rites. So people who are in the first, second, third, fourth, et cetera, maybe to, all the way up to the 10th, 11th, they're not going to see necessarily a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, the, the manual explains the doctrine of Gnosis and what shows how they are Gnostics. The Masons are Gnostics. Gnosticism, my, my, the elder says, my, uh, I'm sorry, the, the initiator, this is the initiator of the person into the 12th degree of the Masonic order. Uh, he says to the one being initiated, Gnosticism, my great and beloved brother, is the sum of some teachings which played a great role in the spiritual and ethical history of humanity. By the way, Elder Athanasius is actually quoting from a manual uh, of the Greek uh, Masonic order that he had, and he was reading from this whole lecture. He's reading from this. So he's not uh, thinking this up. He's not from a third party. There was no Wikipedia in 1980 in, 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 in Greece. He had Gnosti uh, um, um, Freemasons, uh, that had repented. He had people that uh, were uh, bringing him this material. He actually had a battle. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but he had a battle with Masons in the government of Larissa, where he lived. Uh, he he came to know pretty intimately because of a war with Masons in government and in the church, um, eventually in, in, in many places, perhaps in the church. It's hard to say, of course. But it seems like the fruit is pointing to this uh, confirmation that we have a lot of Masons increasingly in the church as well. And, of course, that's that's their goal. Their goal is to infiltrate and destroy uh, the Orthodox Church and, uh, and, and um, you know, establish their um, philosophy, satanic philosophy, as uh, governing the world. Uh, but in any case, he had personal run-ins and, and warfare, let's say, spiritual warfare with Masons in his day. And so he has the text and he's reading it to us and we're reading it now to you in translation. This is from a Greek text. And <clears throat> this initiator says to this uh, newly to be initiated, this younger uh, brother in the, in the order, he says, played a great role in the spiritual and ethical history of humanity. The word gnosis, the Greek word must be understood to mean the opposite of faith. So knowledge is opposed to faith, according to the text. During the first centuries of human ignorance, so here you present a clear, I mean, there's all kinds of things we're talking about theologically and philosophically here, clearly saying humanity is progressing, right? We're getting better and better and better. And that's exactly the opposite of what's taught in the Orthodox Church because we see a fall away and a apostasy at the end of the world, and the rise of Antichrist. So it totally opposed uh, uh, theology and cosmology and eschatology here with, with masonry on, on many levels. During the first centuries of human ignorance, the Gnostics came forth as great and worthy developers and cultivators of progress, of course. Progress, what everybody worships today including the, the, the transhumanists and all the rest. You can bet that many, many, many up in the WF and all of these world globalist organizations are, uh, if not uh, high members of, of masonry, they're a part of other groups that are just as bad or worse than masonry today, offshoots of masonry. The object of faith was dogma from Revelation along with a number of supposedly historic events. The object of faith, so he's talking about 
Christianity included, of course, was dogma from Revelation, along with a number of supposedly historical events. What, what's he talking about? He's talking about, of course, the incarnation, the crucifixion, resurrection, the ascension. He's talking about the whole economy of salvation. Concisely, all this represented the false knowledge of the Christian masses. All this represented the false knowledge of the Christian masses. So in other words, totally rejecting the knowledge gained from the experience and the faith of the saints, of the apostles, of the teachers of the church, totally ignore, uh, not just ignoring, he's warring against it, this man. He's saying, look, you're going to be a Mason now. I got to tell you the truth. All this Christian nonsense for the masses is all just fairy tales. On the contrary, Gnosis, knowledge, Gnosis was only for the elect few. Let me just say one thing before we go forward. It's very interesting in the Orthodox tradition, understanding, and the patristic text. And say Paul doesn't use Gnosis as often as he uses epignosis, epignosis, and that points to a practical, practically gained, experientially gained knowledge, spiritually gained knowledge, you know, like what we say in the Orthodox Church, a theologian is one who prays and one who prays the theologian. So divine illumination, knowledge of God comes through an experience. We saw, we touched, we were eyewitnesses of the word. Okay, this is the Orthodox Christian understanding of true knowledge. They're coming now and saying the exact opposite. All that's fairy tales. And on the contrary, Gnosis was the only for the elect few. Only a few had true knowledge, not the experiential knowledge of God himself incarnate, because that's all supposed of fairy tales now, right? So what kind of knowledge is this that they're they're having? What kind of knowledge is this that they're, they're obtaining? The purpose of this was the research and inquisition of the prevailing ideas, including their initial beginning in the formation of a new philosophy. All right, so that why did they have this uh, this knowledge? Uh, the few is, was because they had to have uh, the beginning of a new philosophy. And then he comes in and, and he says... We don't want this, meaning the faith. We don't want this. We want knowledge. We don't want the faith factor. We want the gnosis factor, right? So we're about true knowledge, supposedly, and they're about fairy tales, those Christians. So we don't want their fairy tales, supposedly, their faith. We want knowledge. And it reminds us of the whole uh, story uh, and experience uh, in Genesis of the serpent with Adam and Eve. And what did he say there? He says, look, I've got the path to knowledge for you. Your eyes will be open and you will have knowledge, the Satan, satanic serpent said to the first formed. Faith, you don't need faith. He rejects faith, slanders faith. He slanders obedience. He slanders trust in God. He comes and says, don't trust God. Don't have faith, in other words. But I'll give you knowledge. I'll give you knowledge of, of uh, good and evil. For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, having now, knowing good and evil. Of course, the devil is telling them to obtain that which God would give you through faithfulness, supposedly obtain it through these means that I will give you. And that is disobedience and knowing good and evil. Uh, in other words, arrive at the goal, which is true knowledge, but through a means which is satanic. So the demonic methodology here is so important. It's very important for all of us to understand how the enemy works and the lies he says. Now, he promises the end, but he, does, he falsely promises they will have the same end, but without God, right? God's without God. That's what the enemy knows. And that's exactly what the Antichrist will promise too. He'll say, heaven on earth, I am God. I sit in the place of God and I give you heaven on earth. I'll give you paradise without God. I'll give you experience of a God-like you know, -like existence without God. And this is all the lies of the enemy. So Elder Athanasius paraphrases and says, God... That Satan was saying to Adam and Eve, God lied to you. He's jealous of you. Does not want you to become gods. 
When you taste the fruit, you will no longer need faith. You will have knowledge. Your eyes will be opened. All right. So this is the lie. And this is exactly what satanically minded initiator uh, in the Masonic Lodge is telling the 12th uh, level of uh, initiation here. Uh, you don't need faith. You need knowledge. So please say one with the enemy of, of salvation. Knowledge over faith, always. And this has been on the rise, especially since the Renaissance and the Middle Ages. And what do we mean by that? Rationalism. Rationalism's creed, which is now we see the whole world is run by rationalism, right? Including many so-called Christians. They are actually rationalists. We saw that with COVID. We saw everybody cower. We saw everybody put science above faith and knowledge above faith, right? We followed the world. We followed the, the, the satanically minded Masons and Gnostics of our day. And we said, we've got to trust not God, but we've got to trust science. We've got to trust the government. We've got to trust this vaccine. We've got to trust all these things. That's going to be our salvation. Did we not? And now people are dying. People are getting killed by uh, heart diseases. And people are dying from heart attacks. And, and that's the fruit of our trust in knowledge of this world and before God and trust in God. One of many things that we've seen in our day. So, rationalism's creed is to be accepted, it must be understood. We don't accept anything unless we understand it, right? But this is preposterous because there are many things we don't understand. Other things accepted, even within the rationalist creed, they don't understand. Evolution? They understand evolution. Are you serious? They, they they understand how millions, supposedly millions and millions of years, and all this happened. No, it's a theory. It's a faith in man, in created world. It's supposed knowledge, which is far from true knowledge. So, it's the rationalist creed. You have to ex to understand everything, to accept it. And of course, that's luciferic pride. There are numerous things we cannot understand, especially in the spiritual realm. We cannot understand. What have we said many times here in this Orthodox Ethos podcast? We've said that, remember when the Lord turned his disciples, this was exactly what's going on. He's, he's building their trust. He's telling them how they have to understand and live this life and this, this spiritual life in God. He's overturned the machinations of the enemy by, by, by turning them and say, you must eat my body and drink my blood. What was he doing? He was crucifying their rationalism. And he was increasing their faith. He was saying, you don't understand, you can't understand. And there are many, many Protestants today who are understand and don't understand, can't understand. How is it possible that the Lord will say to his fellow, his disciples and human beings, he had taken on our nature, you must eat my body and drink my blood. It, Cannibalists were going to become. So he crucified their intellect. And what did Peter say? Peter gave us he gave us the answer that we have to go back to again and again in life. Will you leave, Peter? He says. And then and Peter says, Where will we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. In other words, I don't understand. I can't possibly understand what you're talking about right now, but I trust you. Right? So there are many things in the spiritual life we can't understand. We have to trust. And life is really all about who do you trust? Do you trust yourself? Do you trust the world? Do you trust science? Do you trust the politicians? Who do you trust? Do you trust God? That's the foundation of everything. The Lord says it again and again and again in the gospel. According to your faith. That means according to your trust. According to your faith in me, your trust in me. All right, so this is at the heart of the demonic methodology is to do not accept and seek out the faith factor, but the gnosis factor, right? It's all about knowledge. It's not about trust. It's all about being like the Lucifer and not like the Lord. <clears throat> so Freemasonry, again, is Gnosticism, and it's described by the Apostle Paul. Unless you think that he wasn't talking about Gnosticism, he describes it very well. See to it that no one makes a prey of you by philosophy 
and empty deceit. He's talking about Freemasonry. You know, he's talking about Nazism, but now he's talking about Freemasonry in our day. If he was here, he would say, yep, that's it. That's Nazism. According to the human tradition, human tradition, we have divine tradition in the Orthodox Church. We have divine humanity. We have holy tradition, which is divine. It's not human. It's not man-made. It's given by God. He gave it to us, and we pass it on. That's holy tradition. According to the elemental spirits of the universe, what's he referring to there? Obviously, he's got some in mind. And not, not, should be not, according to Christ. So from Masonic literature, it is clear that what they're talking about is a product of their imagination. And yet they talk about knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And yet much of what they say is just fanciful. They call what we receive, the incarnation, the resurrection, the ascension, as fairy tales. What they're talking about is fairy tales. It's made up in their heads. It is human imagination, empty deceit, philosophy of the mind, just, just sitting down, thinking things up. So here, philosophy that St. Paul is talking about is Gnosticism, and Gnosticism is empty deceit. It's empty. It's fanciful. There's nothing to it. And there's elemental spirits, and these are the Gnostics' own words. He actually was using the words of the Gnostics of his day. Because Gnosticism was, was 200 years before Christ that these movements were around. So it was well-known, well-known in the, in the world. Uh, and so the elemental spirits he's talking about, that is a well-known uh, reference to Gnostic Uh, terminology. How are we doing with our with our connection? Everybody good? I can't. Yeah, it's not the best, not the best connection. But I'm trying, hopefully, hoping that we're going to be okay. Saint Paul Christianizes their terms, including fullness. So fullness was a term that was used by the Nazis as well. But he takes it and he and he says Christ is fullness. You know, people talk about fullness today. I'm going to say a few words about that in a second, but. Christ himself is fullness. There is no incremental aspect here. There's no piecemeal. There's no partial. When we talk about fullness here, it's, it's, it, it, it's one and only thing. It's Christ. So Christ himself, for in him dwells, in Christ himself, for in dwell all the fullness of divinity, the, the Apostle Paul says. So in other words, there are no intermediate gods, right? They're not, they're not this dualism. So he's talking against dualism. He's talking against Gnosticism. He's talking against good gods and bad gods. Christ is all in all. There's only one Christ and he's everything. So a word about fullness because we have a big, big problem in the mission field in America and in the West. We talk about fullness and we think, therefore, the fullness of the faith, you're embracing the full faith. We think that there's partial, uh, we can partially embrace the faith. And we can, we can certainly talk about knowledge about the faith in terms of partial and full. We can talk we can talk about the uh, the appropriation of the practices. You have you have uh, for instance there was 40 years ago, 35 years ago there was the famous group of Protestants who became orthodox in 1988 and they had appropriated over 10 15 years a lot of orthodox things. They did liturgy like the orthodox, they they taught like the orthodox, they you know, they they just copied the orthodox. So in that sense they were Acquiring a lot of things like the Orthodox externally, intellectually. So you can talk about like that, and you talk about those things quantitatively, but this is not fullness. It's, that's not what we're talking about. So when we say I embrace the fullness of the faith, you became Orthodox. And outside of that, there's there's not incremental because it's a personal, intimate communion. Like it's you can't be. You can't be partially pregnant. You can't be partially in communion. You can't be par partially married with your wife, right? These are these are things that are talking about relationships and communion, and that isn't really quantifiable the way we we try to make it. So, just to make sure people understand, that's the fathers never thought like if you walk away from the church, you teach heresy. Jezebel was either in the church or she was outside the church. 
She was either orthodox or she was not. There was not like an incremental aspect to her involvement with Christ. Christ hated the whole heretical teachings of uh, uh, the synagogue of Satan and 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 the, the the depths of Satan here. He didn't say, "Well, there's aspects that are true." Of course, the 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 demonized girl in, in that Paul encountered was speaking the truth. The demons say the truth. The demons know who Christ is. They they shudder and they recognize who Christ is and they, they say, "Christ, you, I've become before the time." Does that mean there's partially Christians they're they're not quite like they have a poor portion of Christianity or something that's on that level we can't talk about fullness and 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 partial Christianity there's only the person of Christ he's all in all when you go to communion you don't take a little part of the holy communion you take all of Christ the you commune of the body and blood of Christ it's indivisible and yet it's divided it's a mystery but it's indivisible it, it can't, we can't make it into pieces. It can't be a little bit in communion. I think we, we really drive that home because there's this idea and it's it's spilled over into ecclesiology and there's people who are preaching the idea that um, there's, there's, there's uh, levels or degrees of being a part of the church. That's just not true. That's not the Orthodox teaching. It's not uh, consistent with patristic vision of Christ and the body of Christ. All right, the 12th degree manual's view of God and creation. Verse 24, now we're still looking at uh, the Gnostics and the, the Masons. Now, Gnostics have a doctrine of a two-person God. This is the actual manual talking, basically. God is a supernatural being, invisible, and made manifest in two totally opposite qualities. This is the dualism of Gnosticism that they're adopting in Masonry. One faculty of God created the universe, and another faculty also participating in creation is an enemy of the source of good. So you have this strange two-person, you know, double-faced God that they believe in. Masonry Gnosticism has no answer to the problem of evil, as we said. It simply states, since good and evil coexist in nature, they just take it as a given, good and evil coexist in nature, therefore the evil participates in the creation of the world. Right? So since it's, since it's obvious, we can look around and we see good and evil, therefore from the beginning in creation, there were two good gods, there were good and evil gods, uh, you know, and this is not unlike some of Far Eastern philosophies. It has no answer, so it fabricates many myths to try to explain these things. Just fabricates, just imagination. It blow, oh, well, yeah, this thing we could, yeah, that sounds about right. The Masons clearly identify themselves as the, as the natural, it should be natural, descendants of the ancient Gnostics. They hope that a higher spirit will free humanity someday from the yoke of matter, just like the Gnostics did. Thus, they reject Christ as the deliverer and redeemer. They reject him. And they say, Christ did not come to deliver us from matter. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is an orthodox understanding. Christ did not come to deliver us from matter, for God is not opposed to matter or the body. Right? That's the orthodox understanding. We didn't need to be freed from matter. But rather, he put matter on. He put nature on. Right? This doctrine is rejected by the Gnostics, okay? Because they believe matter is evil and, and created by evil God. They believe a higher and superior spirit will, will free humanity from the yoke of matter. They believe uh, that uh, they must assist these this high spirit. It's, it's, it's the Lucifer. Uh, they don't say it maybe, but that's that's who else could it be, right? The highest spirit, according to the Satan, the, the deeps, the depths of Satan. Uh, they must assist in this liberation through enlightening humanity. So their role is to work with the good spirit, the spiritual side of not the physical fallen side. And they must work because they're enlightened, they're initiated, they're, they're very uh, progressed in this deep knowledge, this, this special knowledge. Uh, and they have to help all humanity. Of course, humanity is stupid. We're a bunch of sheep. The Christians especially are backwards. They've got it all wrong. They're working for the bad God. So you've got to really, I mean, basically they're the enemy. The Christians are the enemy. And Christianity for them is a heretical philosophy, which was opposed to Gnosis. So Christians for them are a new heretical philosophy opposed to a pre-existing uh, Gnosis, which is the true knowledge and the, the real true religion uh, that pre-existed before Christianity. And Christianity has made a mess of it. 
Christianity has made a mess of everything. Uh, and the initiator into the 12th degree says, if Gnosis did not live on among Christians, he means, right? So he says, all oh, these poor Christians, they've lost the Gnosis, they've lost the knowledge. At least it was instrumental in the deterioration of the other religions in the tombs of which Christianity found its dynasty. So it's saying, look, Christianity essentially has been built on the, on the ruins uh, and destroying the other religions. We helped that to come about, Gnosis, uh, through, you know, the Christians had that and they, to a certain degree, and they used that. And anyway, they want to destroy ultimately all religions and Christianity first and foremost. They don't really believe that religions have anything special. They they say truth is above every religion. And of course, they mean their, their version and understanding and their knowledge. Truth is above every religion. So they have, does that all sound a little bit familiar with a little bit like perennialism? Perennialism is this idea that we're, 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 we're in one form, but we're actually above all. And we're, and we're, there's this common uh, experience of the divine, which is in different forms in different, you know, incarnations, but it's one experience, one truth, one uh, uh, unity. There's a unity above the religions. It's not too far from what we just said. It's masonry. The new Gnostic, uh, the neo Gnostic Masons hope to destroy all religions and especially Orthodox Christianity. Gnosis came at a time of universal collapse, according to them. It was a universal collapse, and then this wonderful spirit, this, this creating part of God brought true knowledge. And Elder Nathanasio says, you know what? This is actually true in a way because it did well with the polytheists and the idolaters before Christ. Right? They embraced it. It told them you no longer have a philosophy of religion. You are the one only, you're only left with mythology and skepticism. And so you need to come over to us. In this way, Gnosticism rendered these systems useless. So they're they're above and beyond, and they're going to lead to a, uh, a promised land uh, in which uh, these inferior systems and inferior, you know, mythologies and, uh, are going to be uh, surpassed, and they're going to have true knowledge uh, through uh, masonry. Uh, they say, amazingly, uh, as, do, as the, the, the father of lies inspiring them, Christ was a great Gnostic and a great mason. That reminds me of people like, anyway, we won't get into that. Whom the disciples did not understand. So they're, his, the Lord's own disciples, according to the Masons, according to this, this, this is all from the book, by the way. This is not speculation. This is from the book that he's reading from, from the Masonic Order in Greece. The disciples didn't get it. They spent three years with the Lord, and they, they didn't understand what he's all about. And he was a true Gnostic, but they were just, you know, nimkomputs, right? They, they couldn't figure it out. And so the initiator says, who's initiating this man into the tree, this is precisely why Freemasonry, the only true religion, having assumed the work of Gnosticism, will succeed in destroying the false religions, starting from the Roman heresy. Okay, so obviously uh, this Gnosticism, uh, Masonry, developed mainly in Western Europe. And so the main enemy and the main representative for them of the Christian uh, experience was Catholicism. It was the papal Protestants. So their main aim was we have to destroy the papal Protestants. Now, when they learned, they saw orthodoxy come out from under the rubble of the Ottoman Empire, for the most part. I mean, obviously, there was the Russian Empire as well. But definitely, uh, in the 20th century, they've had a, they've worked very hard to bring about the end of orthodoxy through masonry, through uh, the uh, avenue of ecumenism uh, through high-ranking masons like Meletius Metexakis, Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, or many others, unfortunately, in the higher echelon, uh, Patriarch Athanagoras, well-known mason, and, and many others since then. And so, unfortunately, they've done a pretty good job in the 20th century catching up but they started long ago with catholicism if you go back into the 1860s 70s and 80s you'll see that there was a, a robust war going on between uh, the pope of rome and masonry and there was a lot of texts and things written against masonry then uh many many trad 
papal Protestants today will tell you that Masonry has taken over in Rome. That they have they've they've succeeded since Vatican II. There'll be a good portion of trad, uh, you know, those who who believe the See of Rome is no longer, or there's absent, there's no Pope in the seat, and all these kind of different groups. They will tell you, yes, Masonry is at fault from the Second Vatican Council going forward. And it's true; it's well known fact that uh, the Pope who called the Second Vatican Council was Mason. He was involved in the Masonic Lodge in where. Constantinople, and that's where he met Patriarch of Nagoras. So we, these are all. This is common knowledge today. It's a. Uh, it's not something that's uh, all that um, r radical, uh, and I don't think I don't. Even, I'm not even sure most people would would bother to deny it. They're very bold today in admitting these things. You can find documentation on this. You've got historical research on this going on in Greece and in America. So there is definitely a conscious effort to overcome and to uh, to take over all the seats of power in Christianity, including orthodoxy. The Gnostics venerate all of the villains and the apostates of the Holy Scripture. This was something new to me. I didn't know. And it really quite phenomenal um, in terms of just a confession of their hatred of the virtues of the saints and the prophets and all the uh, righteous of the Old Testament. So they, they value and honor Cain, and Canaan and uh, Koran, uh, it should be Korah, not Koran, uh, Dathan and Ab Ab Abraham and Judas. All of these villains, apostates, people who fell away, people who were punished, they honored them. Uh, they honored them. The God of creation of the Old Testament is the evil God for he created matter, of course, the natural world. And those who rebelled against the followers of Yahweh are venerable. So they honor them because they say this God of the Old Testament, of Christ, of course, of the New Testament, uh, insofar as this is the same God, then, then well, the, those who opposed him are venerable because w that's the God who created this evil material world that needs to be overcome. Uh, pretty amazing, amazing stuff. 12th degree manual says about this about Cain and civilization. And this should shake us up if we love civilization and we think civilization is something that really is just the aim of our humanity. We need to have a robust civilization. Of course, what the, we need to unpack what does civilization mean. But they say Cain is the father of civilization. <laughs> because we know what happened with Cain and what he did. And they see Abel and they see Seth as a bunch of weaklings. Right? They love Cain because he's the man who ventured out to search and to gain knowledge and to create civilization. So Seth and Abel, who are, of course, um, types of, of, the, of Christ, the Messiah, right, uh, are weak and people of faith. And we don't want faith, we want knowledge. So knowledge turns against faith. Anybody who's for knowledge against faith is, is honorable and venerable for them. Christ introduced faith, and Judas, by his betrayal, attempted to kill this proponent of faith and promote knowledge, which is the weapon of Gnostics. This is why they honor Judas. Lord have mercy. In the 18th degree now, and we're almost done tonight, in the 18th degree, we have the following interesting revelation about the outlook of people who may call themselves Christians but have a very opposing idea of Christian life. So in the manual, they talk about what the cross symbolizes and the, in particular the INRA in Latin, which is over the Lord on the cross. They don't see it as describing the Lord of glory, the, the, the crucified one, but what does it mean? Nature is renewed totally through fire. They take four letters and change it entirely. Entirely, just miss the entire cross, just, just, just cancel out the meaning of the cross. And, and the Latin there is igne natura renovator indegna, which means nature is totally re renewed through fire. And this was from the Stoic philosophy. 
So they, there's nothing to do with Jesus Christ and the King of Jews or anything like that, right? This is also taught by materialism. Materialists see this as well. So if we open the small philosophical dictionary on communism, you'll find this distinction there as well. Of course, communism is in this tradition. Communism is in this, in this uh, outlook. Materialism and satanic in its, uh, in its understanding of uh, Christianity, of Christ, and all the rest. In the manual, it says, the cross having been an object of worship was only the simple image of the equinoxes when the sun during its annual path covers these two points successively. So they just totally reinterpret everything and ignore the Christian understanding. And furthermore, because this is the degree of the Rosicrucians, right? This is the Rosicrucian rose and cross together. This is the name of this three, this level of initiation. And so they see in the cross here something totally unrelated, which has to do with the Egyptian idolatry. They see the cross symbolizing masculinity or the sun, which fertilizes the earth. And they see the roses, because there's an image there that they're looking at in, in this initiation ceremony, the roses and a cross, uh, the woman. So they go back to the Egyptian idea here and they say Osiris was the sun god and Isis the goddess earth. The earth is fertilized by the sun and gives birth to Oran um, or man according to the Egyptian idolatry. Thus the cross of the Rosicrucians symbolizes masculinity or the sun in all its dynamics. The combination of these two symbols, cross and rose, expresses the union of the sexes, which is the symbol of the universal renaissance or rebirth. Nothing to do with Christianity. And the letter G Again, points to Genesis, right? So this is kind of a rebirth, re renaissance, Genesis. So again, they go back to the um, the uh, heart of uh, masonry and Gnosticism, which is rebirth through knowledge and geometry and God and all these things. So they have nothing to do with the cross of Jesus Christ. Same symbols very opposing meaning. So if you think, if you sit, find people who are appealing to images that are Christian and everything, you may want to stop and say, well, how do you understand these images? Are you sure we're on the same page? They use the kind of camouflage all the time, just like Jezebel, right? She was camouflaged in the church of Theatira. So today's Gnostics, they worship Satan. They're not bashful about it at all. They, they, they go, they recognize as the beginning of the good, Lucifer, and they go with the devil and his beginning of all evil, so uh, recognized as the beginning of good, Lucifer, um, I think I have a typo here, he's the beginning of evil and, 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 oh, and the Lord, I should say, they, they see the uh, God of creation as the beginning of all evil. And the beginning of good is Lucifer. That's what should be written here. Therefore, the God of the Old Testament is a bad guy because he introduced evil by creating matter. And on the contrary, the devil, Lucifer, is the good spirit, the good God. And this is taken from an analysis of masonry by, by a guy by the name of Leo Taxil. And he says further on, in today's, he's, he's doing an analysis of contemporary masonry, and this is being quoted by Elder Athanasius, the masons of the 33rd, Degree kneel in front of Bathomet, of course, that's true of sin, who's raised above the altar, none other than the great architect of the universe. So it, it should be stated, of course, that masonry is not monolithic. There's a variety of different lodges, different philosophies, different things. It's not one thing, but this is one version of masonry where this happens. And um, yeah, so that gives you some witness to what's really happening today in masonry, according to one of the, those who've done a lot of research on it. So Elder Athanasius says, look, it's very obvious here that we're dealing with Gnosticism. We're dealing with the depths of Satan, the same, that which was condemned in the book of Revelation. These are Gnostics and they believe in a uh, dualistic vision of God and creation. So we must oppose it with all our might. And he says, the ancient fathers of the church turned against Gnosticism with all their might. Today, we must stay informed and 
opposed Freemasonry, the newer manifestation of Gnosticism. In this, we receive much help from the Holy Revelation of St. John, the book that we're reading, Revelation of, to our, of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Apostle John, and the revealing statement of the Lord that we are dealing with the depths of Satan. So the Lord is teaching us, he's saying, to be on guard and to war against the Gnosticism of our day. The Lord foretells and warns his enemies, the Satanists of our day as well as then, Repent, or else I'm coming to you quickly, and I will fight against them, the Satanists, with the sword of the mouth. St. Paul uses the same words for the coming of the Antichrist. His name is the Lawless One, because Masonry is a forerunner of the Antichrist, whom Christ will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, as we read in Scripture. So Satan is real. And he's working full time with the most horrible means against the church of Christ, against the Orthodox Church. Let's not forget that Satan has his residence and his throne here on earth. He's the Pantocrator of this world, right? The ruler of this world. Let's not, in other words, the passions, all those who live according to the passions and the lies uh, he's, that he spews out. Let's not forget that Satan has his synagogue, right? He has his religious following in masonry and all those who use it and, and and succumb to it including other movements like zionism let's not forget that satan has the deep things of his maliciousness knowing all this let us stand let us keep sober and be vigilant and finally a, a word or two because we're going to run out of time on this verse however he says at the end here 25 that which you have, hold fast until I come. And the Orthodox New Testament version is that which you have, hold fast. Oh, no, that's actually the, old, the Orthodox New Testament version. The New, New King James version is that which you have already, you have already, hold fast till I come. So pretty much the same thing. So let's see um, just a few words about this faithfulness and this keeping of the holy tradition, the holy Revelation, which is passed on generation to generation. That's what tradition means, being passed on. Paradosis, that's what it means. We're going to talk about that next week in our first section. We're going to talk all about paradosis, tradition. Very important to understand. Very important to understand why if you reject holy tradition, you reject paradosis, you reject Christ, you reject Christianity, you reject the church. There's no way around that. And that's the tragedy of Protestantism, is that they've rejected without understanding it, that which Christ gave and, and has been passed on by the Holy Fathers from the apostles to our day, and that is the church. That is the whole experience of, of the divine humanity in the church. It's in that form and in that in that in that um, vessel, uh, which is the church and holy tradition in the church. So we'll talk about that next week. But the last thoughts here before we depart, because I don't want to I don't want to end on a very heavy negative note, because that's not how the elder is uh, presenting things, not how scripture presents it. The Lord now turns to the faithful. And one thing is sure, that we will always have a number of faithful who stay true to the Lord. We will always have the remnant. This number will represent the Orthodox Church, which will always stay Orthodox, true to Christ, despite the tumult of the Ark, despite all of her misfortunes in the ocean of history. Despite all of it, the church will be true. There will be the true Orthodox faithful until the end. The church truly will be comprised of those who remain stable, who remain true Christian, who remain Orthodox, who are not easily influenced by the various winds and waves of heresies of every season or by the craftiness of evil people who are always ready to invent theology to justify the funeral of their Orthodox spiritual life. Let me repeat that very beautiful line from the Orthodox. Very true in our day. Those evil people, in other words, people given over to the will of the enemy. They're not evil by nature. They're doing evil things. They're, they're, they're listening to the enemy of our salvation. It says they, the craftiness of these people who are always ready to invent theology, which is not theology, of course, it's just human philosophy, to justify the funeral of their own orthodox spiritual life. So what happens first? We lose the ethos. We lose the life. We lose the epignosis gained from spiritual experiences. That's the problem. 
We, we walk away from the ascetic life. We walk away from the mystery. And then what happens? We start to invent fallacies, fantasies, mythologies, our own theology. We start to glorify ourselves. We fall away. And we, then that's when heresy comes. The dogma is lost. And unfortunately, we see that in our day uh, very clearly. So there will always be the remnant, brothers and sisters, who do not lower their head or bow their knee to the various forms of Baal, the false god. And St. Paul writes to the Romans, and he says, I kept myself, says God, I kept for myself 7,000 men who not bow the knee to Baal. Should be Baal. So too, he says, the Apostle Paul, at the present time, and of course, until the end, the whole 2,000 years, from the first to the second coming, it's a 1,000 years, as I say, that's what is meant, the first to the second coming, in that period, there will always be a remnant, he says, chosen by grace that will never depart. The question is, will, will we be in that remnant? That's the question. Will we be among the faithful? That should be our daily concern, to be following the Holy Fathers, the saints, and to be a part of that remnant, which is not indifferent to the Jezebels in our midst. And God forbid that we fall and become followers of such uh, such contrary spirits. So, hopefully that has been illuminating, helpful, showing you the path forward, the nature of the enemy's machinations, his methodology, and what was going on in the Church of Thyatira and what's going on today. And it's not much different. It's a question of quantity, not essence or quality. There is a reign of quantity today that seems to change the quality, so to speak, right? There's a exponential growth, so to speak. Right? We feel like things are going faster and faster and faster and faster. There is that sense. But ultimately, there's nothing new under the sun. And then and now, we're dealing with the same depths of Satan that are opposed to, to the Lord. So let us stand, as the, as the elder says, let us be among the remnant so that when he comes, and we want him to come quickly, we can be with him in the clouds on the right, among the righteous. God help us. Thank you for your attention. Let's open it up to your questions. See what you got in terms of questions. All right, so the first question I have is from Maria Vlaco Christos. Maria Vlaco Christos. Everybody hang connection still. We're all good connected. I'm a little concerned tonight. Looks like we're okay, John. Yeah. Father, thank you for this very informative episode. What would you recommend to do with the objects that the Masons have after they have passed? Thank you in advance for your response. Well, I don't know what you're talking to talking about in particular, but it sounds like the objects you're referring to are somehow peculiar to the, their life as Masons or their worship or whatever it might be. I don't know. You didn't give me any particulars. But I would think anything that is a part of that whole outlook and somehow connected to the whole outward view. Um, it's hard for me to answer because I don't have any specifics, but I would say that it, we would be hard-pressed not to have anything to do with them um, if they're clearly a part of the Masonic, Satanic um, outlook. Then I think we should not have anything to do with it. But again, I don't know what you're talking about. You have to be more specific. You can write me per personally if, if it's important you need to analyze. But uh, the 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 holy things that we have have the there's the opposite in this world and that is the things of the enemy of salvation that's used to do his will and that we should have nothing to do with and if that's the case then i think separate yourself from that but again i don't know exactly what you're asking uh peter does this teaching on masons apply equally to the groups like rotarians elks i've heard these described as quasi masonic um in Greece, generally speaking, the Spirit Father and I have known, talked about this on Mount Athos and in somebody like Father George Metalinos, who's reposed, great, great uh, teacher of the faith from Athens. He uh, and others would say that they are a part of the whole 
a masonically inspired you know mentality and so we should not be a part of them we should not be a part of any of that you know as christians we have so much to do for the church and in the church i just i even if there were not terribly let's say there were just as i said there are aspects of masonry in america perhaps in other places where you know they're fairly benign on one level still you shouldn't have nothing to do with it still you should not be ever supported obviously I think anything that reeks of or has been supported by or instituted by Masons, like, we should distance ourselves from it. I don't see why that would be beneficial for us. We have so little time. Uh, what, what, why would we spend it investing in that which is not building up the body of Christ? Um, so questions that people have submitted that are very personal, uh, you can submit to them privately. I see one question here that's very uh, personal. I'm not going to answer that online. You can submit that to me privately, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll address that uh, uh, when you write me. And you can find ways to write me through Orthodox Ethos website and all the rest. Another question, will the Antichrist emerge from the Orthodox Church, since this is the church and even the, the elect might be fooled? So the Antichrist, as we know, and we'll talk about when we get there in this whole series, is, uh, according to the teachings of the Holy Fathers, uh, going to be from the tribe of Dan. And so he's going to be, a, at least on, maybe not known to everyone, but he'll be from uh, a Jew, and he'll be supporting uh, the reign in Jerusalem and all the rest. So I don't think um, he will be from the orthodox church in a you know like a, somebody who grew up and attended services and 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 was a bishop or a priest or something and he becomes the answer no however he will be very charismatic very beloved by a lot of people he'll, he'll do wonderful things for humanity and in that sense, there'll be a lot of orthodox who will see him as a friend and an ally uh so it will be it will be that uh, those who do not have uh, a, a life in christ are not repenting, uh, will not have an, do not have an experience of Jesus Christ, life in Christ. They will not see. Uh, they will have many people will have lost the criteria. We see that happening all the time. We have people today who are teaching very obvious heresy. So they've lost their criteria. They've lost the sense of boundaries of orthodoxy and, and heterodoxy. So they're they're setting themselves up to accept the lie of the uh, uh, of the. The, the good but benevolent world ru ruler who the Antichrist will initially be. But I don't think he'll be actually emerging from within the Orthodox Church as some kind of ruler or clergyman or something like that. No. George asks, my best friend from law school from 12 years ago also told me he is now dressing as a woman and is considering identifying as one permanently. I don't know what to say or do. We went to a very conservative Catholic law school I am Orthodox. What do I do? I'm beside myself and frankly don't want to continue being best friends, yet in some way it feels wrong to completely cut them off, though I'm leaning in that direction at the moment. So you if you've stated your 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 you've shared with you what you think, you know, what what you think, why this is not blessed, why God doesn't want this, if you've stated that clearly for the sake of your conscience and the sake of giving the truth. Uh, and what the Lord says, what the saints say, and you've given that to this uh, friend of yours, and he's not interested and walks away, uh, at, at that point, uh, there's not only not are you required to insist, that's not pedagogically what the Lord expects of you, but you're actually uh, in danger if you continually uh, associate and go along and, and say, well, I've got to stay, I've got to stay, I've got to stay. No, you don't. He has a, he has a creator and a redeemer. And what you need to do is fall on your knees and pray. You need to fall on your knees and pray because prayer is going to be more effective than words which have already been rejected. Prayer is going to be more effective and better for you to stay away from such a distorted, perverted outlook on what it means to be a human being, a man, a woman, and all the rest. This is a very deep delusion that this friend of yours is falling into. You're not going to stop it or save it through words, you may help through prayer and tears far more. Uh, and maybe you're 
your departure, which has to be explained as on the basis of you have departed from what it means to be not only a Christian, but a human being. I mean, you're, you're, you're departing from what it means to be a, a male, a human being. This is the portion of your of so much about what, what it means to be a human being. Why are you doing this? Why are you throwing off what God intended, how he made you and all the rest? You need to state that and you need to say, I can't be a party of this. I, you know, I, I'm always here for you if you want to come out of this delusion. But this is a spiritual delusion you're in. And I'm not going to be supportive of it because it's not good for you for me to support it. And, and I feel like my presence would be supportive of it. So, um, you know, that's what the Apostle Paul says clearly in his epistle. When somebody refuses to hear the church, refuses, you know, he's a different context, but similar stance. He says, give, give them over to say they might basically come to their senses. So this is not a member of the Orthodox Church, and you're you're not uh, a pastor. Uh, you need to look to walking on a narrow path and yourself. I would say pray and depart. Uh, question, is the Eucharist to embody Christ or body become like him? Is the Eucharist to embody Christ? Well, I'm not sure if I would use the term embody Christ, depending on what you mean by that. I'm not sure what you mean by that uh, in this context, but... We partake of the body and blood of Christ, the Eucharist, absolutely to become like him. So we were made in the image and likeness. When the fall happened, mankind, man lost the likeness and the image was obscured. When we are baptized with the incarnation, resurrection, ascension, and the redemption through Jesus Christ in the mysteries of the church, the the image is restored and the likeness is now open to us but that requires our synergy our cooperation and that's a cooperation that happens continually always we have to be on the path of return in other words union communion which we constantly to remain in communion and to grow in communion and so absolutely the eucharist is at the center of that acquiring the likeness but it has presuppositions and that is the, the love of all, with all our heart, soul, and mind of God and of our neighbor, which means you can't do that unless you're picking up your cross, you're fasting, praying, the old man is getting thrown off, and the new man is being appropriated. That whole process is presupposed for that Eucharist to be, make you like him. And that's going to be a, first and foremost, a spiritual likeness. Uh, and, uh, and only afterwards, the, the, the whole sanctification of the body goes along with it, of course. And that's why the Eucharist is, the, why the Lord has given us the Eucharist, because we're body and soul. We're not just soul. So hopefully that answers your question. Next question. How do I practice an Orthodox life with the Catholic in the Catholic Church? I live in a rural area for, for far from an Orthodox community. Well, the Orthodox life is in the orthodox church i mean if you're going to talk about the orthodox life with any integrity you're talking about the orthodox church you're talking about the mysteries you're talking about the the whole orthodox theology phronima faith it's one package it's one it's, the, it's christ it's christ is in you can't chop up christ and say i'll have an orthodox life but i'll be outside the orthodox church so I don't, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, you can appropriate orthodox things. You can draw close in some ways quantitatively and intellectually to the orthodox church and not be a part of the orthodox body, the body of Christ, the orthodox church. But that's far cry from the orthodox life. In other words, you're, so you can prepare yourself. You can begin slowly to throw off that which is contrary, which is going to include the, the various heretical doctrines of the papacy, uh, of created grace, of the filioque, uh, the distortions in terms of uh, ancestral sin and the immaculate conception, that error, and other things uh, which are not the, the inspired by the Holy Tradition, by the Holy Spirit in the church, and, and not consistent with the, with the Orthodox Church. You can throw all those things off. You can begin to appropriate the Orthodox life uh, by uh, drawing near and acquiring as much as possible from where, from where you are the Orthodox way of thinking. You can read the lives of the saints. You can become more and more inspired. But as long as you remain in a communion which is cut off and does not have the holy mysteries and the grace of God, and that's the Orthodox Church's teaching. I'm not telling you my ideas here. 
That's what St. Gregory Palamas teaches, that's what St. Gregory Mark of Ephesus teaches. That's what all these great saints who dealt with this issue and represented the Orthodox Church and, and expressed the Orthodox mind have said very clearly that, unfortunately, what we call today Roman Catholicism, uh, you know, the Latin Church, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter. What that is, is not the body of Christ. So you can't remain there and have an, the life of the body of Christ. I know that might come as a shock or upset you as someone who's been there many, many years, perhaps, very committed to it. But what you see and apparently like and want in the Orthodox Church is not it's inseparable from the Orthodox uh, life and church. I mean, you can't separate the life from the church. It's like take the body and I want to be part of the body, but I don't want the body. It's not possible. You got to draw near, and you got to you got to throw off that which is contrary. You got to appropriate as much as possible, but you got to eventually have to draw near. Does that mean once a month? So be it. You don't have to. You don't. The, the Lord sees this in 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 the diaspora, in the far corners of the earth, where there's not readily an Orthodox community down the street or in the city you're in. The Lord sees all that. He's not bound by these distances. If you go once a month, uh, eventually you got to open up a new door for you. There might be a new mission. There might be you might move. Uh, God, don't worry about that. That's not your concern. Your concern is to begin, and to begin you have to go. Just like the incarnation, there was a time and place that he was incarnate. There was a time and place that he walked. He was ascended on a, on a particular place. That's how the church is. It's in a particular time and place. You have to meet Christ there. And that's where you become grafted into the incarnation and you live the life of the church. Father, why did the Holy Fathers at Quintix Ecumenical Council allow Gnostics to be chrismated only since they were so different. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure what you're referring to. The Quintex Council was very late, and Gnosticism had been dealt with many times before that. So you have to be more specific. Which Gnostics are you talking about? And the whole question of reception of, of heretics or schismatics in the church is so messed up in the West today. People do not understand the, the, the Orthodox mind about these things. Um, the presuppositions for economy in the Orthodox Church are not what a lot of people believe. Uh, it's not based on the theory uh, only or even mainly of what they believe to be God. For instance. There are other cases of St. Basil in his 47th canon, even when they're doing economy in Rome, he says, no, no economy. We have to baptize. So the criteria is very important to understand the patristic mind, the criteria, why they and when they economize, uh, it doesn't, it might surprise you, uh, but it's not going to ever undermine the acrivia, in other words, the exactitude of what we understand the church to be, the mysteries to be. It's not going to undermine that. It's not going to be done without great need. It's not going to be done just flippantly. It's not going to be done... Um, unless there's a real, real need. It's pastorally. Um, so I would have to, you know, examine the particular example you're, you have in mind. I don't know what you're referring to in the Quintex, which which heretics you're talking to, about, but uh, it's not what you think in that, you know, I mean, Arians were chrismated. Arians denied the divinity of Christ. You can't get much worse than that. I mean, deny the divinity of Christ and you, and be a Christian is that's impossible. There are many Arians today who think they're Christians. They're not Christians. You can't be Christian and deny the divinity of Christ. So the church, however, did economy because they kept the form. They were in every, in every other way. They were like the, the Orthodox. And the important thing for the church fathers was that the form was kept. They didn't believe there was a mystery of the church. They didn't believe that there was grace outside the church and the mysteries. That was very early established. There's no grace in the mysteries of the heretics. So what they're doing is receiving the form. They're saying that, that, that you've received the external, now take the spirit and receive the spirit. In those cases that there was a real need, the church has that ability, just like the Lord received the thief on the cross without a baptism in water. And he put him in paradise immediately because the Lord is above his own commandments and above the mysteries and the forms of the mysteries. He can do what he likes. But we don't violate that and because it pastorally it undermines the unity and the boundaries and the identity of the church. That's why the 
the church fathers wouldn't depart from those criteria. They want to have those there. And it's been proven out in our day. I don't know if you're following me because there's a lot of things that I can't explain in detail right now. But it's been proven out in our day in the last 200 years that when we walk away from the form of the mystery, we are going to have huge problems. And we see today in the Orthodox Church that many priests have bought into the idea that it doesn't matter if you immerse in baptism. Where do they get that? They get that from the heretics, from the various heretical heterodox communions have departed from the preview of the church long ago. And, and it begins in the 13th century with Aquinas, who says, well, baptism is just a washing. It doesn't matter if you sprinkle it, it doesn't matter if you pour it, it doesn't matter if you baptize, you immerse. That's not true. No church father ever thought that. And the word itself means immersion. The word itself means immersion. So baptism is not a washing or a sprinkling. It's immersion. That's what the word means. Does it matter anymore that what words mean anymore? People people need to remember these things matter to the Holy Church. You do not depart from that without a grave need, just like the Lord would not have been flippant about receiving the mystery of baptism for someone unless there was a grave need, like he was on the cross and he was being baptized in his blood, essentially. And there was, so there it is. I mean, so we can go on. I've talked about this a million times, but it's an important topic and I appreciate the question. Um, but I don't have the particulars of what you're referring to, so it's hard to answer. Uh, when you ask questions, everybody, be very specific in your questions. All right, because I'm it's, not only am I answering this on the fly, I'm immediately answering your questions without any kind of ability to go and, and you know give you patristic citations or anything else, but you've got to be more specific a lot of times. What do we make? Solomon's temple being such a big deal to Masons. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I can probably speculate, but I don't know. So, Bill Travis, you'll you'll have to look that one up on your own. That's that's a good question, though. I mean, obviously, they are enamored with sim symbology and the occult sim symbols and all of the. The, all of the mythology and all of the implications, and and so there. There's a lot of Masonic literature on ancient Egypt and ancient Israel and all this. So, I don't know how essential it is to the whole question, but I don't know the answer. You know who might know the answer is is an Orthodox convert, uh, Brother Augustine. Uh, that's, that's how he goes by on, online. You can find him, and he's a former Mason. He's written a book on it. So anybody who's interested in this topic and wants to go deeper, I would recommend that. It's a book that he wrote uh, as as a former Mason who converted Orthodoxy. He wrote all about the problems with Masonry. Uh, and he goes by Brother Augustine. And uh, maybe somebody can put a link, link up for everybody uh, as I'm talking here. John or somebody can find a link to that uh, book. Um, let's see, where were we? Father, do you have any advice to reject passionate thoughts, lust, pride, anger, before you begin to engage with them and fall down into the abyss? How do we reject thoughts before we start to engage fall into the abyss? So, so much of our spiritual struggle is going to be achieved before the moment of provocation. And so if you are caught off guard, you have not done your prayer rule in the morning, you're not prayerful throughout the day, or you've given yourself over to lewd thoughts, or you've given yourself over to eating excessively, or you've done certain things that make it even harder for you to be vigilant spiritually then you're setting yourself up for a fall when those thoughts come. And the devil has thousands of years of experience to set somebody up for a fall, right? He knows how it works. He's seen it done again and again and again. He knows what he needs to do. He gets you to sleep a lot. He gets you to eat a lot. He gets you to talk a lot. And if you're engaging in those things and you're not watchful over yourself throughout the day, then it's going to be even greater and easier for you to fall into those thoughts and to engage them. The other thing is that... Um, you have to force yourself. People, people want to lead the spirit life without forcing themselves. It's impossible, brothers and sisters. You have to force yourself. So you have to force yourself to get up in the morning and pray. You have to force yourself to fast. It's a struggle to be an Orthodox Christian. 
When you start to do that, what happens? You attract the grace of God. It takes time. It takes perseverance. It takes faithfulness. Attract the grace of God. The demons, seeing that, are less uh, emboldened. You become and you start to establish good habits. And so you get into a rhythm and you get into a stance in life, which is like, uh, so to speak, like a uh, like a soldier who has been through a lot of warfare. And so he it's it, now it's not a, it's not he's not green anymore. He knows what to expect. He knows when he hears something, sees something, uh, there's a provocation. He's been there and he knows what might be coming. And that's exactly how it is with the Christian who's been struggling for a time. He's not easily caught off guard. So I think you need to be patient. You need to be prayerful. You need to be watchful. And then when these thoughts come, you're going to be ready to encounter. Now, when they provoke you, then the, you fall back into prayer. You don't engage them and debate them. Generally speaking, you never really debate with the enemy and his thoughts. You just flee. Free, flee meaning you take refuge in the prayer. So the prayer is, is, is the beginning and end of so much of the spiritual life. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Now, another way to help yourself is to avoid the occasion for sin. Avoid anything that might remind you of it, lead you into it. Obviously, if you're falling into pornography, for instance, and when does that all happen? Well, it never happens when you're sitting around a table with somebody, probably. God help us. It happens when you're alone. It happens when you're in the bathroom. I don't know where. But it's happened. there's places that it happens and where it doesn't happen. So if you you have to force yourself. You have to force yourself not to go to those places, not spend time in those places where there's occasion for sin. That's going to help a lot too. So when you make a decision to hate the sin and you start to live like that, those things are going to dissipate. To take time, but if you persist, you they dissipate. You can't get to where you want to go without the cross, without struggle, without forcing yourself, without patience and perseverance. That just doesn't happen. It's 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 just a dream. We're dream dreaming about the day that will be uh, spiritual men and women, right? Hopefully that helped you. It's going to be a quick answer. Sorry. I would really recommend that you read, for instance, the Evergeti Nos, which is a famous collection of four volumes, or the Hierondicon, the Saints of the Desert Fathers, or uh, St. John Climacus, or um, Dorotheos of Gaza, some of the classics in the, in the spiritual life we need to read and, and to gain more knowledge of, the, of how to fight the fight. My another question. My grandfather, dad's dad, was a Freemason, had a full Freemason funeral and burial. My dad was not, I was raised Protestant. Any specific prayers that I should say in my family? Well, so in the Orthodox Church, formal prayers in the church are said only for Orthodox Christians. We pray for everyone and anyone, whether they're, you know, a part of the Masonic lodge or not it doesn't matter we can pray for them we pray with a jesus prayer first and foremost and then we we, we pray this the akathist and the supplication services to the mother of god and to the saints and to our lord a beautiful it's a beautiful canon to our lord the beautiful canon to uh, akathist and to the lord jesus christ uh, many people don't know as much about those because they're, they're only in one or two prayer books in english but they're beautiful so there's all those things that you can dedicate and pray and offer. You can pray in your morning prayers for them by name. In your private prayers, you can pray for them and, and you can offer prayers. And, and it, there's no special prayer that I know of for people who are in masonry or Protestants who have reposed. Uh, what is prayed most by our fathers and ascetics are, is the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer, you don't say the name again and again and again, but you can say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on the name. And then Pray 300 or 100 prayers with a prayer rope for the and without mentioning the name again and again. God knows you don't need to go back again and again. Another question, Father, how are clergy not chastised for pre preaching ecumenism? Is there any counselor body that could be could warn them to stop? Well, of course there is. The Holy Synod of the local church that they're in should warn them 
and 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 uh, and rebuking them if they're stepping out of line and they're engaging in ecumenism. Ecumenism defined here, we need to define the terms, is the whole ecclesiology of ecumenism. That's what really is at stake. In other words, a teaching and preaching and a belief about the body of Christ, which is Christ, right? Christ is the head and it's his body. So we're talking about Christ, which is which is erroneous, which is not the body of Christ, which is not the person of Christ. It presents him, it presents the church, the body of Christ, in a way that is is not that which was taught by the Holy Fathers for 2,000 years. And it misleads people either to think that they're already in the body or they're partially in the body. There's a variety of theories. And then when we go and we pray, which the canons forbid, to pray with heterodox uh, liturgically, certainly, but even in the house even, uh, you know, formally a priest or uh, or layman to go and engage in common prayer, uh, that is forbidden by the Holy Canons. And the reason that is forbidden is because when we pray together, the assumption and the presupposition is that we are one in Christ and we have a common life in Christ. That's what's presupposed that people ignore. They don't understand that. And that does not help anyone to come and to stay, to come to Christ and to come to the church. So you're undermining salvation, you're misleading people, and you're distorting uh, the life in the church, and you're distorting the, the boundaries and what the boundaries are. All of that is a form of ecumenism. All right, so now going back to the question, uh, the Holy Synod of the Church of whatever, Greece or Russia or whatever, and is is mainly responsible for bishops and priests who have, have departed from the narrow path in the Orthodox doctrine. Unfortunately, the, the, the sickness of this particular heresy, not unlike iconoclasm in the 7th and 8th centuries, 9th centuries, um, eight, 700s, 800s, and, and not unlike uh, Arianism in the 4th century, even after a church council, you had people who were Arians and you had mixture of Orthodox and Arians. There's a lot of confusion for a time. Uh, we had, even after the Fourth Ecumenical Council, you had unions with the Monophysites. There's been this kind of confusion in the church before. It is extreme in our day, unfortunately. And we have a lot of very weak need and weak-minded uh, uh, bishops who are not prepared to, to lay down the boundaries, just like Bishop here in Theatira, who was rec reprimanded for not bringing her either to repentance or kicking her out of the church. We have the same problem today, but on multiple levels across the Orthodox Church. So what's the solution? Well, there has to be, as there all was, the mention of God. God is the one who brought the Orthodox back after the, the apostasy with the Monothelites, for instance. St. Saint, Saint Maximus proposed, and there was 20 years before the Ecumenical Council who justified him. Or with the Latins and St. Mark of Ephesus, or with the many the very various false councils and false unions, or every iconoclasm, there's there's been periods where there's been a, a remnant that's remained faithful, but for the sake of that remnant, because of their sacrifice, because of their witness, because of their confession or even martyrdom, the Lord uh, acts. And so it's not going to be any different in our day. So So there has to be a disposition on our part, priests, bishops, everybody who's faithful and wants to remain faithful to the Orthodox, to sacrifice, to confess, and to and to withstand and 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 give a witness to the truth of the of the nature of the Church, the body of Christ of Christ Himself. And when that happens, and people start to ultimately pick up their cross and, if need be, suffer, then I think you will see a divine intervention. But again, it's going to be God working together and for the sake of the church to finally clean house and those who refuse to repent to be excommunicated or be defrocked or whatever it needs to be. Uh, and we're going to, I think we're going to face more difficulties in the future, not less. We're going to have tougher times coming, but there will be a, uh, there will be a day when the sun will rise. Uh, the Orthodox faith will again rise and be proclaimed from the highest, uh, places in the church. I believe that the saints have said that. And so we just need to continue to persevere. I can't answer for them and why they don't rebuke those hierarchs. Some of them are first hierarchs. Some of those are, 
are very, um, you know, should have been rebuked, but have not been for a variety of reasons. Secularism, um, there's, there's a lot of answers to that. And it's a, it's a tragedy that there isn't clarity. Is it okay to see plays put on by a community theater group that uses a local Masonic temple for their performance venue? The group is not affiliated with the Masons. You know, if you're strict, the answer is no. If you're not strict and you want economy, I'm not your spiritual father. I don't know you. I can't really answer. But strictly speaking, I wouldn't go. Is there an economy? Can there is there a reason? It, it's going to depend on your on your spiritual father, your parish priest, your bishop. I don't know, whatever. Um, but going into a Masonic temple where they're they're basically the depths of Satan, according to the teachings of the scriptures and the, and the Elder Athanasius is going on. I don't think it's a good idea. Now, spiritual realities affect the physical world. They're not like it's not just irrelevant. There's, there is a, there are places that are made holy, and you can sense that holiness. You go to the, the tomb of Christ. You go to the, the holy mountain, and you say this place is holy, and it's been made holy by sacrifice and prayer and sacri and 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 uh, fasting and all the rest. And you go to places where people have been murdered, people have been killed, people have been, whatever, and you can sense that this is a dark place, right? So I, I wouldn't go to, I don't want to go to dark places. Do you want to go to like? A really bad part of town where who knows what's happened, a lot of sin has gone on. Do you go there and hang out? No. So a Masonic temple is kind of like that. And I, I don't think it's a good idea to go, but again, I'm not your spiritual father. You got to figure it out with your spiritual father. Has there been an attempt in Greece to glorify the first abbess of St. Nectarius' monastery, the Rhodes? I don't know. I have not heard anything. I'm not the end-all, be-all on what's happening in Greece right now, um, in, down in southern Greece. So I don't know that, Daniel. I have not heard anything. Another question. How do we understand the, play, the place of the Catholic saints in orthodoxy? That's kind of a curious question. Why would there be a place of saints recognized by Catholicism, which we consider to be a heretical assembly? Catholicism teaches heresy. Papal primacy and infallibility are considered heretical teachings. The filioque is considered heretical teaching by St. Gregory Palamas, calls it one of the gravest heresies ever. The created grace is a heresy. With that place, which now has no authority spiritually for the Orthodox, and now it declares somebody a saint, why would that have any, any place in Orthodoxy? It doesn't have any place. I don't know of anybody in the Orthodox Church that says, oh, they recognize so and so as a saint. Therefore, will venerate those saints, those those who are called saints by by Roman Catholicism. It doesn't happen. In fact, there are several that that there's been a little bit of discussion early on, like Francis of Assisi. But the, the serious patristic sources I know do not accept him as a saint. And in fact, in his teachings, in his life, signs of delusion. And we've talked about this, and there. Are Papers written on this. Father Sarah from Rose talks about this in his survival course. There's a paper written on this, very interesting, comparing the spirituality of Francis of Assisi with that of Sarah from Oserov and why there's big, big holes there, big differences, problems. Many people see him as a wonderful, you know, iconic kind of figure. But in the Orthodox Church, we're looking at things strictly on the basis of the fathers, the ascetics that have gone before us. And we have them as their guide. And when we look at Francis of Assisi, for instance, we see the big problems. We see big problems in the way he talks about his spiritual life, the way he experiences things, the way he, you know, there's there's red lights going off. There's 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 red flags being lifted, saying there's something wrong here. So so the little that there has been some discussion on some people like Francis of Assisi, um, but most serious. Discussion I've seen of that in Greece and and in, in to a certain degree in America, but there are people who, who are positive in America, but in Greece it's all pretty negative. Uh, in other words, they do not recognize his sanctity. All right, next question: Why would a priest flip the spoon upside down when giving communion? You're going to have to ask the priest, Maria. I don't know why would he do that. He's totally unnecessary. The only thing I can imagine is that he's trying to avoid having this person's mouth touch the spoon, maybe? I don't know. 
which would be, I think, problematic in Paris. Nothing to fear whatsoever. For everybody's uh, touching the spoon and getting sick or communicating sickness, all of that, of course, is borderline blasphemous and delusional, and people need to reject those thoughts and not cultivate them. So I would very much encourage any priest to say to stop doing that practice, because even if it gives the impression that you're afraid of people alive, that's terrible. That's going to undermine people's faith. It's going to undermine people's trust, and you're going to put people in 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 trouble, in, you know, in terms of their thoughts and undermine them. That's terrible. We shouldn't do that. Why does the Greek Orthodox Church give bread with leaven? After communion, when Christ was sinless, hmm, interesting question. Uh, so that you're, I'm assuming you're talking about andidron, right? Andidron, andizoro in Greek means instead of the gifts, and it's the bread from the the loaf of bread that's baked. It's called the prosphora, that which was offered, and it has the sphagi that has the seal on it, and that's from what, and that's what's cut and used. And put on the chal, uh, uh, the uh, discos, and then offered, uh, and that's what comes the body and blood of Christ. The, that from that loaf is kind of peace and distributed to the people um, uh, if they do not commune. All right, so andidoron is for those who do not commune on that day, and they get that which is instead of the gifts. The gifts meaning the holy gifts, the holy communion. So those people go up afterward, they receive from the hand of the priest, they kiss the hand of the priest, and they receive the, the andidoron, the, that which is instead of the gifts, because they did not commune, and then they uh, are given that blessing, right? It's basically a blessing and a way, I'm not, you know, I don't think there's been a lot of speculation on what it means theologically, but I guess you could say it's a way of showing the community and, the, and, and participating in that way, uh, which is a blessing for them. Um, so there's no question there that we're talking about communion. So I don't think there's any problem for it to be le leavened bread. We use leavened bread anyway in the Holy Communion because it was not a Passover meal the Lord uh, ate. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's appropriate for the first divine liturgy. So, But that's a whole other question. We can talk about that. Uh, that's one of um, perhaps 10 more issues that we can raise in a future podcast dedicated to Catholicism, Orthodox understanding, and, and appraisal of, of, of the teachings. Um, and one of them would be the whole question of unleavened or leavened bread in a future podcast. Maybe we can address that theologically. If an Orthodox Christian is led astray from the official Orthodox Church, then how much is the person responsible? Okay. So what is the official Orthodox Church? What does that mean? You know, is there an unofficial Orthodox Church? No. The Orthodox Church is the body of Christ. It's the clergy and the people together. And so they're led astray in what sense? There's some heretical-minded cleric that has confused them and taught them terrible things or scandalized them. That's the cleric, not Christ and not the saints who is t teaching them or leading them astray, scandalizing them or whatever it might be. So we have to make that distinction. We have to understand that. This is, I mean, look at the book of Revelation. We have Jezebel. She's in the church. We have Jezebel in every generation. This is the way it is. We have Judas. We have Arius. It's a, it's a, they have to be expelled. They have to be, if they don't repent, they have to be expelled. But until that happens, you and I and all the rest, if you're going to be mature, Christians have to distinguish between the body of Christ, the saints, and the sinful members, and then the apostate members, even if they've not been excommunicated or what, but they're in apostasy. In other words, they're, they're, they're far from the narrow path. We have to make those distinctions. So we ultimately are responsible. Now, there's there's what the Pais, the St. Pais calls elefrentica in Greek, which means basically... Uh, maybe mitigating circumstances, right? And so the Lord will be very merciful, according to Elder Paisios. Certainly, if people have been scandalized, the little ones have been scandalized, the Lord says it'd be better to, to be thrown in the sea with a, with a you know, rock around your neck. Right? And it's pretty harsh for those who scandalize the little ones. So there's obviously going to be a lot of mercy for those people. Um 
Yeah, I would agree with you. Some leniency has to be in account. Yeah, certainly. Absolutely. All right. I think I've answered all the questions here in YouTube. Maybe, maybe I didn't. Um, the very first question I think I skipped initially, and that is you, we, we talked about sex for marriage has to have purpose. Yeah, we've talked about this in other places too. So Elder Athanasius talked about it, I think last week or two weeks ago, that two aspects of sexual relations in marriage, pleasure and purpose, they go together. They're both blessed in that context, only in that context. And when there's pleasure and purpose, then it's blessed. Purpose means that we're open to procreation. Yes. You ask, what do many other priests say that sex and marriage is not only limited to that? I don't know. You have to ask those priests. I'm not their priest, those priests. It seems they might be thinking of St. Paul who says it's better to marry than to burn. Yes. Doesn't really ne 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 it's better to marry than to burn. Okay. It's not to fornicate, but to with one wife, and in that context, to fulfill your purpose, which is in marriage, partly a big part of it is to procreate, to have children. That's a, one of the purposes why the Lord established marriage. Is it not? Yes, it is. Is there this side? Is there this side to create an arena of chastity in marital relations too, where both struggle to grow further in chastity? Is there this side? What does that mean? I don't know what you mean. Is there this side to create an arena of chastity in marital relations too? where both struggle to grow further in chastity. I'm not really, you've lost me, I understand what you're asking me. But definitely in marriage, there's a struggle to acquire chastity, absolutely. The chastity is not just for those who are outside of marriage, it's in marriage too. Abstinence and purification and eventually leaving aside sexual relations altogether. Eventually, there's canons that talk about it after 40. Now we're up into the 50s and 60s. God help us. The way we live, we, we think sexual relations until we're in old age is, is, is perfectly understandable and blessed. That's not the way it is in the church. Church sees it in, as something that is not, we're not going to keep it until the last days of our life. We're going to set it aside and focus on the spiritual life. That's what the saints say. St. Saint Paisio says that. He praises those who go that that route? He doesn't. Nobody's forced. God forbid. But we're not praising people. We're not saying it's, it's a normal thing to want to have sexual relations when you're seventies and eighties. That's that's not. We don't. We're gonna die. Like why are we engaged in that? Guy? It's like saying I I, I want to eat. I want to eat my ice cream. I gotta eat my ice cream. Okay. Like, is that really set that aside for Christ? Put it aside. There's more things. Better things. Crucify the old man. Don't be a slave to that desire. Put it aside. You don't need that, right? And how much more for sexual relations, which has as main purpose, along with union and pleasure, is purpose, right, of, of procreation. We're open to that, at least. All right, I'm not going to go further into that. That's a discussion that we can have, but it's really a discussion for a priest and the couple, and hopefully the priest is teaching them what the saints teach, and they can uh, work out all the details. Uh, out. All right. I think we're going to call it a night. What are we at here? <clears throat> we're at uh, two hours and 36 minutes. Uh, it's been very good. I hope I feel like we had a good night and it's been uh, Michael Whitcoff. Yes. I'm sorry. I didn't mention Michael's non internet name. Michael Whitcoff is brother Augustine. So if you want to find that text, it's called the secret world of Freemasonry, the lost truth about Masons. Alchemist and Other Secret Societies by Michael W. Whitoff. I want to repeat that. Let me actually put it up on the screen for everybody. I can do that. That's one of the miracles of, of, of uh, <laughs> StreamYard, which we use, <clears throat> excuse me, is that I can create a little banner here and I can plug that in. Oh, but it didn't, didn't, didn't come over. Let me see if I can do it again. Nope. One more time. Let's try it again. Um, I think it's an important book, given our topic tonight. And you, if people want to go deeper, let's see if I can make this work. Yes. All right. There it is. 
the secret world of Freemasonry, right? There's the title. There's the author. If you're interested in going deeper, this will give you a uh, convert to orthodoxy who went through it and writes all about it. Hopefully it helps. All right. Not having any more questions. Well, we do have one or two questions. Let's see. Probably we have a few questions from the Crowdcast crowd, although we can answer them on Thursday. But let's answer a few. And if you're still with me, God bless you. If you're going to depart because it's getting late on the East Coast, I understand. Don't worry about it. How infiltrated by the Masons is the church today? Is If there are Masons among the church hierarchy, why don't we see anyone excommunicated for that? Well, you you, you must know, Krasimir, that the Masons don't go around telling everybody they're Masons. It's a secretive society. People don't uh, easily get exposed as Masons, right? Uh, people claim after their death, so-and-so was a Mason. So this is not a heresy that people are going around promoting. I'm a Mason. I'm a Mason. It's uh, it's pretty secretive. And if it is happening in one or two places, um, they probably, because, you know, the local bishops or bishops in that area, maybe all of them are corrupt. And so there's no fear. But really, that's pretty rare. People think and hear things and see things. And they say, well, this is really problematic, this teaching, this, this thing. And so it's very hard to know for sure. And have some idea because after the death of certain very prominent matters, uh, um, very prominent leaders, we have the Masonic representatives coming out and claiming them as one of their own. And during their life, there's actually letters now that have come out, for instance, Patriarch Cortes, uh apparently was uh, very involved in the Masonic Lodge in Constantinople. And uh, the same with Maletus Smetiksakis, who was the Patriarch of Constantinople in 1922-23. Very, very prominent Mason, claimed as a Mason. I think it's pretty pretty general knowledge that he was a part of the Masonic Order. So after their death, so during their life, they didn't go around uh, saying much. If they, if they did, uh, I mean, I don't know. I can't answer for the people back in the 20s why they didn't do anything about it. So it's not it's a problem that is very hard to to uh, deal with because it's all done in the shadows. Hard to say how infiltrated we are. It's really hard to say. I cannot venture a guess. Seems like they're, they're doing a pretty good job. If you look at the fruit, some of these statements, some of the stances of, of prominent hierarchs reminds you of uh, the pan heresy of ecumenism, which, of course, Masons are very much uh, behind. And that's historically uh, proven. That a lot of the Masons that started the ecumenical movement in the 30s and 40s, um, the leaders were, were Masons. I keep hearing from Roman Catholics that the different Orthodox jurisdictions like Greek and Antiochian are actually separate churches. No, they're not separate churches. That They're not in communion with one another. They're separate jurisdictions within the one church. They're separate administrations. In other words, we have the Church of Antioch. It's been there for 2000. Well, Year as a patriarchate from the fourth century that exists in, in in you know Lebanon and Syria they came over to America Australia whatever they sent their priests and administratively they're all connected that's all that means so we have a local church in Antioch just like we did in the first millennium so I don't know Roman Catholics don't know much about church history they don't know much about church jurisdiction they don't know for instance the Church of Cyprus was made a separate autonomous church in the fourth century. They don't know that they think that everybody was under Rome or something. It's you know they're just ahistorical. A lot of a lot of the, their discussion of these things. They have a um, you go on and asking. They have a legalistic view of, of what a church is. So how do I explain to them that we are all one church, even though there are breaks in communion? Now you're referring to this this contemporary schism between Moscow and Constantinople for the most part, and that is happened many times in church history it's a tragedy it's awful it's very uh, problematic. like we should all be in pain and we should be against those things that happen to bring about this schism um but for the time being the church history is what your answer is no church history and you'll see that actually this has happened many times before there's been schisms uh besides the great schism I mean, there were schisms between rome and constantinople several times there's schisms, uh, Antioch and Constable. There's you know, a number of things around the whole ecumenical councils that were temporary schisms. 
Um, so I think they're just ignorant. They need to know church history and um, that's the solution. And if you go and read church history, you can give them specific examples to help them through. Father Peter, do you think that the current Pope is part of the Masonic agenda? Supposedly he is a Jesuit. Is this order connected to Masonry? Is this order connected to Masonry? Um, I don't know much about the Jesuit order, but I have heard that, uh, yes, it is. But I, you know, I don't know. Like, I can't answer the question. Uh, but uh, is the current Pope part of the Masonic agenda? Well, judging from what, uh, judging from what um, the fruit... Uh, it seems like he, he's pretty consistent with what they're they're trying to achieve, uh, but I don't know, and I have not researched, and I'm not that interested in that question. So I cannot answer you uh, definitively, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised, let me put it that way, because the fruit seems to point in that direction. He says things, and he does things, which are very much a part of the globalist Masonic agenda, and he goes in and, you know, basically connects with Muslims and says that the the religions are willed by God and things like this, you know, are totally uh, inconsistent with Christian view of revelation and the church and uh, and salvation, so theology. So it seems to be that he's in, in step. Uh, Elizabeth, Father, your blessing regarding Freemasonry. And are the Knights of Columbus in the Roman Catholic Church Masons? Thank you, Elizabeth. I do not know. I do not know if they are. Uh, Matthew Dunn says, when I was a papal Protestant, I was a member of the Knights of Columbus. I would say certainly no. They were created as an alternative to Masonic lodges for Catholics. So there you go, Elizabeth. I think somebody like Matthew would have a better answer, answer than I. Okay, last question, and then we're out. Thank you for this evening. Well, just a thank you. Well, thank you. God bless you, and glory be to God. Yes, thank you. I have a... All right, we'll sign out. We'll see you uh, again soon. God bless you. Uh, we'll chant uh, to the Troparian of the Holy Cross, and then we'll uh, we'll be back uh, on Thursday for the question and answer. And then we're going to go for Friday. We're going to do Friday, not Thursday. We're going to do Friday a new podcast. Uh, we'll start at 5 p.m. on Friday. So our question and answer for our Crowdcast people, our patrons, will be as usual 5 p.m. on Thursday. And then we'll have a podcast on Friday. You'll want to... Um, uh, through our Orthodox Ethos YouTube channel. You want to uh, sign up there if you're not or, or get uh, notifications there and you will you can join us on Friday and we'll announce the topic soon. Okay. All right. Uh, let's chant to the Tra Tra Brian of the Holy for the Holy Cross and we'll see you soon. So son kiri eton la onsu Kev lo yi son ting kleron o mi an su ni kans di basi lepsi katavar var on doru menos keton son filaton di atustavrun su politevman. To the prayers of the Holy Father Jesus Christ our God. Have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen.